Good evening and welcome to week 11 of Plague Spirit Company. Tonight we are pleased to continue our Henriad series uh, and be bringing you Henry IV, part two. Enjoy the show. Open your ears. For which of you will stop the vent of hearing when loud rumor speaks? I, from the Orient to the drooping West, making the wind my post horse, still unfold the axe commenced on this ball of earth. Upon my tongues, continual slanders ride, the which in every language I pronounce, stuffing the ears of men with false reports. I speak of peace, while covert enmity under the smile of safety wounds the world. And who but rumor, who but only I, make fearful musters and prepared defense, whilst the big year, swollen with some other grief, is thought with child by the stern tyrant war, and no such matter. Rumor is a pipe blown by surmises, jealousies, conjectures, and of so easy and so plain a stop that the blunt monster with uncounted heads, the still discordant wavering multitude can play upon it. But what need I thus, my well-known body to anatomize among my household? Why is rumor here? I run before King Harry's victory, who in a bloody field by Shrewsbury hath beaten down young Hotspur and his troops, quenching the flame of bold rebellion even with the rebels' blood. But what mean I to speak so true at first? My office is to noise abroad that Harry Monmouth fell under the wrath of noble Hotspur's sword, and that the king before the Douglas rage stooped his anointed head as low as death. This have I rumored through the peasant towns between that royal field of Shrewsbury and this worm-eaten hold of ragged stone where Hotspur's father, old Northumberland, lies crafty sick. The posts come tiring on, and not a man of them brings other news than they have learnt of me. From rumors' tongues, they bring smooth comforts false, worse than true wrongs. <laughs> Who keeps the gate here, Hope? Where's the Earl? What shall I say you are? Tell thou the Earl that the Lord Bardolph doth attend him here. Well, his Lordship is walked forth into the orchard. Please it your honor, knock but at the gate, and he himself will answer. Here comes the Earl. What news, Lord Bardolph? Every minute now should be the father of some stratagem. The times are wild. Contention, like a horse full of high feeding, madly hath broke loose and bears down all before him. Noble Earl, I bring you certain news from Shrewsbury. Good and God will. As good as heart can wish. The king is almost wounded to the death and in the fortune of my lord, your son, Prince Harry, slain outright, and both the bloods killed by the hand of Douglas. Young Prince John and Westmoreland and Stafford fled the field, and Harry Monmouth's brawn, the Hulk Sir John, is prisoner to your son. Oh, such a day! So fought, so followed, and so fairly won, came not till now to signify the, dignify the times since Caesar's fortunes. How is this derived? Uh, saw you the field, came you from Shrewsbury. Oh, I spake with one, my lord, that came from thence, a gentleman well-bred and of good name, that freely rendered me these news for true. Now here comes my servant Travers, who I sent on Tuesday last to listen after news. Uh, my lord, I, I overrode him on the way, and he is furnished with no certainties more than he haply may retail from me. Now, Travers, what uh, good tidings comes with you? My lord, uh, Sir John Amfreville turned me back with joyful tidings and being better horsed outrode me. After him came spurring hard a gentleman, almost forespent with speed, that stopped by me to breathe his bloodied horse. He asked the way to Chester, and of him I did demand what news from Shrewsbury. He told me that rebellion had bad luck and that young Harry Percy's spur was cold. 
With that, he gave his able horse the head, and bending forward, struck his armed heels against the panting sides of his poor jade up to the rowel head. And starting so, he seemed in running to devour the way, staying no longer in question. <laughs> Again, said a young Harry Percy spur was cold. Hot spur, cold spur. That rebellion had met ill luck? Now, my lord, I'll tell you what. If my young lord, your son, have not the day, upon mine honor, for a silken point, I'll give my barity. Never talk of it. Why should that gentleman that rode by Travers give then such instances of loss? What, who, he? He was some hilding fellow that had stolen the horse he rode on, and upon my life spoke it of enter. Look, here comes more news. Yea, this man's brow, like to a tidal leaf, foretells the nature of a tragic volume. So looks the strand whereon the imperious flood hath left a witnessed usurpation. Say, Morton, didst thou come from Shrewsbury? I ran from Shrewsbury, my noble lord, where hateful death put on his ugliest mask to fright our party. How doth my son and brother? Thou tremblest, and the whiteness in thy cheek is apter than thy tongue to tell thy errand. Even such a man, so faint, so spiritless, so dull, so dead in look, so woebegone, drew Priam's curtain in the dead of night. And who would have told him half his Troy was burnt? But Priam found the fire ere he his tongue. And now I, my Percy's death ere thou reportst it. This thou wouldst say. Your son did thus and thus, your brother thus. So fought the noble Douglas, stopping my greedy ear with their bold deeds. But in the end, to stop my ear indeed, thou hast a sigh to blow away this praise. Ending with brother, son, and all are dead. Douglas is living, and your brother yet. Before my lord, your son. Why, he is dead. See what a ready tongue suspicion hath. He that but fears the thing he would not know hath by instinct knowledge from others' eyes that which he feared is chanced. Yet speak, Morton. Tell thou an earl his divination lies, and I will take it with such sweet disgrace and make thee rich from doing me such wrong. You are too great to be by my gainsaid. Your spirit is true, your fear is too certain. Yet for all this, say not that Percy's dead. I see a strange confession in thine eye. Thou shakest thy head and holdst it in fear or sin to speak a truth. If he be slain, say so. The tongue offends not that reports his death, and he doth sin that doth belie the dead, not he which says the dead is not alive. Yet the first bringer of unwelcome news hath but a losing office, and his tongue sounds ever after as a sullen bell, remembered tolling a departing friend. I cannot think, my lord, your son is dead. I am sorry I should force you to believe that which I would to God I had not seen. But these, mine eyes saw him in bloody state, rendering faint quittance, wearied and out breath to Harry Monmouth, whose swift wrath beat down the never daunted Percy to the earth, from whence with life he never more sprung up. In view his death, whose spirit lent a fire even to the dullest peasant in his camp, being brooded once, took fire and heat away from the best-tempered courage in his troops, from, for from his metal and his party steeled, which once in him abated, all the rest turned on themselves, like dull and heavy lead, and as the thing that's heavy in itself upon enforcement flies with greatest speed, so did our men, heavy in Hotspur's laws, lent to this weight such lightness with their fear that arrows fled not swifter toward their aim than did our soldiers aiming at their safety fly from the field. Then was that noble Worcester so soon tamed prisoner and that furious Scott the bloody Douglas whose well laboring sword had three times slain the appearance of the king gone fail his stomach and did grace the shame of those that turned their backs and in his flight stumbling in fear was took. The sum of all is that the king hath won and hath sent out a speedy power to encounter you, my lord, under the conduct of young Lanster and Worsmoreland. This is the news, the fool. For this I shall have time enough to mourn. 
in poison there is physic. And these news, having been well, that would have made me sick, being sick, have in some measure made me well. And as the wretch whose fevered, weakened joints like strengthless hinges buckle under life, impatient of his fit, breaks like a fire out of his keeper's arms, even so my limbs, weakened with grief, being now enraged with grief, are thrice themselves. Hence, therefore, thou nice crutch, a scaly gauntlet now with joints of steel must glove this hand. And hence thou sickly quaff, whose that art a uh, guard too wanton for the head, which princes, fleshed with conquest, aim to hit. Now bind my brows with iron and approach the ragged stour that time and spite doth bring to frown upon the enraged Northumberland. Let heaven kiss earth and let not nature's hand keep the wild flood confined. Let order die. Keep and yet let this world no longer be a stage to feed contention in a lingering act. But let one spirit of the firstborn Cain reign in all bosoms, that each heart being set on bloody courses, the rude scene may end and darkness be the barrier of the dead. This strain and passion doth you wrong, my lord. Sweet Earl, divorce not wisdom from your honor. The lives of all your loving complices lean on your health, the which if you give her to stormy passion must perforce decay. You cast the event of war, my noble lord, and summoned the account of chance before you said, let us make head. It was your presermis that in the dole of blows, your son might drop. You knew he walked your perils on an edge more likely to fall than to get away. You were advised his flesh was capable of wounds and scars and that his forward spirit would lift him where most trade of dangers rang. Yet did you say, go forth. And none of this, though strongly apprehended, could restrain the stiff-born action. What hath then befallen? What doth this bold enterprise bring forth more than that being which was like to be? We all that are engaged to this loss knew that we ventured on such dangerous seas that if we wrought out life, twas ten to one. And yet we ventured for the gain proposed, choked the respect of likely peril feared, and since we are o'erset, venture again. Come, we will put, we will all put forth body and goods. Tis more than time, and my no most noble lord, I hear for certain and dare speak the truth. The gentle Archbishop of York is up with well-appointed powers. He is a man who with a double surety binds his followers. My lord, your son had only but the corpse, but shadows and the shows of men to fight. For that same word, rebellion, did divide the action of their bodies from their souls. And they did fight with queasiness, constrained as men drink poisons that their weapons only seemed on our side. Before their spirits and souls, this word rebellion, it had froze them up as fish are in a pond. But now the bishop turns insurrection to religion. Supposed sincere and holy in his thoughts, he's followed both with body and with mind and doth enlarge his rising with the blood of fair King Richard scrapped from pomfret stones, derives from heaven his quarrel and his cause, tells them he doth bestride a bleeding land, gasping for life under great bowling brook and more and less do flock to follow him. I knew of this before, but to speak truth, this present grief hath wiped it from my mind. Go in with me and counsel every man the aptest way for safety and revenge. Get posts and letters and make friends with speed, never so few and never yet more need. Oh, Sirrah, you giant. What says the doctor to my water? He said, Sir, the water itself was a good healthy water, but for the party that owed it, he might have more diseases than he knew for. <laughs> Men of all sorts take a pride to gird at me. The brain of this foolish compounded clay man is not able to invest anything that intends to laughter more than I invent or is invented on me. I am not only witty in myself, but the cause that wit is in other men. I do here walk before thee like a sow that hath overwhelmed all her litter but one. The prince, prince put thee into my service for any other reason than to set me off. Why, then I have no judgment. 
thou horse and mandrake. Thou art fitter to be worn in my cap than to wait at my heels. I was never manned with an agate till now, but I will inset you neither in gold nor silver, but in vile apparel, and send you back again to your master for a jewel, the juvenile, the prince your master, whose chin is not yet fledged. I will sooner have a, have a beard grow in the palm of my hand than he shall get one on his cheek. And yet he will not stick to say his face is a face royal. God may finish it when he will. Tis not a hair amiss yet. He may keep it still at a face royal, for the barber shall never earn sixpence out of it. And yet he'll be crowing as if he had written man ever since his father was a bachelor. He may keep his own grace, but he's almost out of mine. I can assure him. What says Master Domelton about the satin for my cloak and my slops? Uh, he said, sir, you should procure him better assurance than Bardolph. He would not take his bond and yours. He'd like not the security. Let him be damned like the glutton. Pray God his tongue be hotter. Or a horse on... Archetyphal, a, a rascal yet forsooth knave to bear a gentleman in hand and then stand upon security. This horse and smoothy pates do now wear nothing but high shoes and bunches of keys at their girdles. And if a man is through with them in honest taking up, then they must stand upon security. I had as lived they would put rat's bane in my mouth and stop it with security. Uh, I looked to should have sent me two and twenty yards of satin, as I'm a true knight, and he sends me security. Well, he may sleep in security, for he hath the horn of abundance, and the lightness of his wife shines through it. And yet cannot he see, though he have his own lantern to light him. Where's Bernolf? Uh, he is gone into Smithfield to buy your worship a horse. <laughs> I bought him in Paul's and he'll buy me a horse in Smithfield and I could get me a wife in the stew as I were manned, horsed, and wived. Uh, sir, here comes the nobleman that committed the prince for striking him about Bardolph. <clears throat> Wait close, I will not see him. What's he that goes here? Falstaff, and it please your lordship. He that was in question for the robbery. Oh, he, my lord, but but he hath since done good service at Shrewsbury, and as I hear, is now going with some charge to the Lord John of Lancaster. What? To York? Call him back again. Oh, Sir John St Falstaff. Uh, boy, tell him I am deaf. You must speak louder. My master is deaf. I am sure he is to the hearing of anything good. Go pluck him by the elbow. I must speak with him. Sir John! What? A, a young knave in begging? Is there not wars? Is there not employment? Doth not the king lack subjects? Do not the rebels need soldiers? Though it be shame to be on any side but one, it is worse shame to beg than to be on the worst side. We're, we're worse than the name of rebellion can tell you how to make it. You mistake me, sir. Why, sir? Did I say you were an honest man? Setting my knighthood and my soldiership aside, I had lied in my throat if I had said so. I pray you, sir, then set your knighthood and your soldiership aside, and give me leave to tell you you lie in your throat if you say I am any other than an honest man. I gave thee leave to tell me so? I lay aside that which grows to me? If thou gettest any leave of me, hang me. If thou takest leave, thou wert better be hanged. You hunt counter, hence avaunt. Sir, my lord would speak with you. Sir John Falstaff, a word with you. Oh, my good lord. God give your lordship good time of day. I'm glad to see your lordship abroad. I heard your lordship was sick. I hope your lordship goes abroad by advice. Your lordship, though not clean past your youth, have yet some smack of an ague in you some relish of the saltness of time in you, and I must humbly beseech your lordship to have a reverend care of your health. Sir John, I sent for you before your expedition to Shrewsbury. And please, your lordship, I hear his majesty is returned with some discomfort from Wales. I talk not of his majesty. 
you would not come when I sent for you. And I hear, moreover, his highness has fallen into some whoresome apoplexy. Well, God mend him. I pray you let me speak with you. Well, this apoplexy, as I take it, is a kind of lethargy, and please, your lordship, a kind of sleeping in the blood, a horse and tingling. What to tell you me of it, be it as it is? It hath it original from much grief from study and perturbation of the brain. I, I have read the cause of his effects in Galen. It is a kind of deafness. I think you are fallen into this disease, for you hear not what I say to you. Oh, very well, well, my lord, very well. Rather than please you, it is the disease of not listening, the malady of not marking that I am troubled with all. Mm. To punish you by the heels would amend the attention of your ears, and I care not if I do become your physician. I am as poor as Job, my lord, but not so patient. Your lordship may minister the potion of imprisonment to me in respect of poverty, but how I should be your patient to follow your prescriptions, the wise men may make some dram of a scruple, or indeed a scruple itself. I sent for you when there were matters against you for your life to come speak with me. And I was then advised by my learned counsel in the laws of this land service, I did not come. Well, the truth is, Sir John, you live in great infamy. He <laughs> that buckles himself in my belt cannot live less. Your means are very slender and your waist is great. I, I would it were otherwise. I would my means were greater and my waist slenderer. You have misled the youthful prince. The young prince hath misled me. I am the fellow with the great belly and he my dog. Well, I am loath to gall a new healed wound. Your day's service at Shrewsbury hath a little gilded over your night's exploit on Gatchill. <sighs> you may thank the unquiet time for your quiet or posting that action. My lord? But, since all is well, keep it so. Wake not a sleeping wolf. Oh, to wake as uh, a wolf is as bad as smell a fox. What? You are as a candle, the better part burnt out. A wassail candle, my lord, all tallow. If I did say of wax, my growth would approve my, the truth. There is not a white hair in your face, but should have his effect of gravity. His effect of gravy? Gravy? Gravy. You follow the young prince up and down like an ill angel. Not so, my lord, your ill angel is light. But I hope he that looks upon me will take me without weighing. And yet in some respects, I grant I cannot go. I cannot tell virtue is of so little regard in these costermongers times that true valor is turned barrowed. Uh, pregnancy is made of a tapster and his quick wit wasted in giving reckonings. All the other gifts appertain. To, pertinent to man as the malice of this age shapes them are not worth a gooseberry. You that are old consider not the capacities of us that are young. You do measure the heat of our livers with the bitterness of your galls. And we that are in the wayward of our youth, I must confess, are wags too. Uh, did you get your name in the scroll of youth that are written down old with all the characters of age? Have you not a moist eye, a dry hand, a yellow cheek, a white beard, a decreasing leg, an increasing belly? Is not your voice broken, your wind short, your chin double, your wit single, and every part about you blasted with antiquity? And will you yet call yourself young? Fie, 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 Sir John. Uh, my lord, I was born about three of the clock in the afternoon with a white head and something of a round belly. For my voice, I have lost it with hallowing and singing of anthems. To approve my youth, youth further, I will not. The truth is, I am only old in judgment and understanding. And he that will caper with me for a thousand marks, let him lend me the money and have at me. 
for the box of the year that the prince gave you. He gave it like a rude prince, and you took it like a sensible lord. I've checked him for it. And the young lion repents. Mary, not in ashes and sackcloth, but in new silk and old sack. Well, God send the prince a better companion. God send the companion a better prince. I cannot rid my hands of him. Well, the king hath severed you. I hear you are going with Lord John of Lancaster against the Archbishop and the Earl of Northumberland. Yea, I thank you, pretty sweet wit for it. But look, you pray, all you that kiss my lady peace at home, that our armies join not in a hot day. For by the Lord, I take but two shirts out with me, and I mean not to sweat extraordinarily. If it be a hot day and I brandish anything but a bottle, I, would, I might never spit white again. There is not a dangerous action can peep out of his head, but I am thrust upon it. Well, I cannot last forever. But it was always yet the trick of our English nation, if they have a good thing, to make it too common. If you will need say I am an old man, you should give me rest. I would to God my name were not so terrible to the enemy as it is. I were better to be eaten to death with, with rust than to be scoured to nothing with perpetual motion. Well, be honest. Be honest, and God bless your expedition. Uh, will your lordship lend me a thousand pounds to furnish me forth? Not a penny. Not a penny. You are too impatient to bear crosses. Fare you well. Commend me to my cousin Westmoreland. If I do, fill up me with a three-man beetle. A man can do no more separate age and covetousness than ca can part young limbs and lechery. But the gout galls the one and the pox pinches the other. And so both the degrees prevent my curses. Boy! Oh, sir! Uh, sir? Hmm. What money is in my and purse? Uh, seven groats and um, two pence. You know, I can get no remedy against this consumption of the purse. Borrowing only lingers and lingers it out. But the disease is incurable. Go bear, bear this letter to my Lord of Lancaster, this to the Prince, and this to the Earl of Westmoreland, this to the old Mistress Ursula, whom I have weakly sworn to marry since I have perceived the first white hair of my chin about it. You know where to find me? Pox of this gout, or gout of this pox. For the one or the other plays the rogue with my great toe. Tis no matter if I do halt, I have the wars for my color, and my pension shall seem the more reasonable. Good wit will make use of anything. I will turn diseases to commodity. Thus have you heard our cause and known our means. And my most noble friends, I pray you all speak plainly your opinions of our hopes. And first, Lord Marshal, what say you to it? I well allow the occasion of our arms, but gladly would be better satisfied how in our means we should advance ourselves to look with forehead bold and big enough upon the power and puissance of the king. Our present musters grow upon the file to five and twenty thousand men of choice, and our supplies live largely in the hope of great Northumberland, whose bosom burns with an incensed fire of injuries. The question then, Lord Hastings, standeth thus, whether our present five and twenty thousand may hold up head without Northumberland. With him, we may. Yea, Mary, there's the point. But if without him we be thought too feeble, my judgment is we should not step too far till we have his assistance by the hand. For in a theme so bloody-faced as this, conjecture, expectation, and surmise of aids incertain should not be admitted. Uh, Tis very true, Lord Bardolph, for indeed, 
It was young Hotspur's cause at Shrewsbury. It was, my lord, who lined himself with hope, eating the air and promise of supply, flattering himself in project of a power much smaller than the smallest of his thoughts, and with so and so with great imagination, proper to madmen, led his powers to death, and winking leapt into destruction. But by your leave, it never yet did hurt to lay down likelihoods and forms of hope. Yes. If this present quality of war, indeed the instant action, a cause on foot, lives so in hope, as in an early spring we see the appearing buds, which to prove fruit, hope gives not so much warrant as despair that frosts will bite them. When we mean to build, we first survey the plot, then draw the model, and when we see the figure of the house, we must then must we rate the cost of the erection, which if we find outweighs ability, what do we then but draw anew the model in fewer offices, or at least desist to build at all? Much more in this great work, which is almost to pluck a kingdom down and set another up, should we survey the plot of situation and the model, consent upon a sure foundation, question surveyors, know our own estate, how able such a work to undergo, to weigh against his opposite, or else we fortify in paper and in figures, using the names of men instead of men, like one that draws the model of an house beyond his power to build it, who, half through, gives o'er, and leaves his part-created cost and naked subject to the weeping clouds, and waste for churlish winter's tyranny. Grant that our hopes, yet likely of fair birth, should be still born, and that we know possess the utmost men of expectation. I think we are so a body strong enough, even as we are, to equal with the king. What? Is the king but five and twenty thousand? <laughs> to us no more. Nay, not so much, Lord Bardolph. For his divisions, as the times do brawl, are in three heads. One power against the French, and one against Glendor. Perforce a third must take up us. So is the unfirm king in three divided and his coffer sound with hollow poverty and emptiness? That he should draw his several strengths together and come against us in full puissance need not to be dreaded. If he should do so to French and Welsh, he lives his back unarmed, they baying him at the heels. Never fear that. Who is it like should lead his forces hither? The Duke of Lancaster and Westmoreland against the Welsh himself and Harry Monmouth. But who is substituted against the French? I have no certain notice. Let us on and publish the occasion of our arms. The Commonwealth is sick of their own choice. Their over greedy love hath surfeited and habitation giddy and unsure hath he that buildeth on the vulgar heart. O oh, thou fond many, with what loud applause didst thou beat heaven with blessing Bolingbroke before he was what thou wouldst have him be. And being now trimmed in thine own desires, thou beastly feeder, art so full of him that thou provokest thyself to cast him up. So, so thou common dog, didst thou disgorge thy glutton bosom of the royal Richard, and now thou wouldst eat thy dead vomit up and howls to find it? What trust is in these times? They that, when Richard lived, would have him die, are now become enamored on his grave. Thou that durst dust through, through his dust upon his goodly head, when thorough proud London he came sighing on after the admired heels of Bolingbroke, Christ now, O earth, yield us that king again, and take thou this. O thoughts of men accursed, Past and to come seems best, things present worst. Well, shall we draw our numbers and set on? There are time subjects and time bids be gone. Master Fang, have you entered the action? It is entered. Oh, where's your yeoman? Is it a lusty yeoman? Will it stand to it? Sirrah, where's Snare? Oh, Lord, hi. Good master, Snare. Here, here. Snare, we must arrest Sir John Falstaff. Yeah, good master, Snare. I have entered him and all. It may chance cost some of us our lives for he will stab. Oh. 
Alas, the day, take heed of him. He stabbed me in mine own house, most beastly. In good faith. Oh, cares not what mischief he does, if his weapon be out. Oh, he will foin like any devil, and will spare neither man, woman, nor child. If I can close with him, I care not for his thrust. Oh, no, nor I neither. I'll be at your elbow. And I but fist him once, and it comes but within my vice. I am undone by his going. I warrant you, he's an infinitive thing upon my score. Good Master Fang, mm. hold him sure. Yeah. And good Master Snare, let him not scape. Oh, comes continually to Pie Corner, saving your manhoods, to buy a saddle. And he is indebted to dinner at the Lubber's Head in Lombard Street to Master Smooths the Silk Man. I pray you, since my axion is entered and my case so openly known to the world, let him be brought into his answer. Oh, a hundred mark is a long one for a poor lone woman to bear. And I have borne and borne oh, and borne and have been fobbed off and, and, and fobbed off and and fobbed off and, and from this day to that day that it is a shame to be thought on. Oh, there is no honesty in such dealing unless a woman should be made an ass and a beast to bear every knave's wrong. Oh, yonder he comes. And that errant mumsy nose knave Bardolph with him. Well, do your offices. Do your oh, no. offices. Master Fang, Master Snare, do me. Do me, do me your offices. Oh, now, whose mare's dead? What's the matter? I arrest you at the suit of Mistress Quickly. Away, varlets. Draw, Bardolph. Cut me off the villain's head. Throw the queen in the channel. <gasps> Throw me in the channel. I'll throw thee in the channel. Wilt thou? Wilt thou? Thou bastardly rogue. Murderer, murderer, oh, thou honeysuckle villain. Wilt thou kill God's officers and the king's? Huh? Oh, thou honeyseed rogue. Thou art a honeyseed and a, a man queller and a woman queller. Keep them off, Bartle. A rescue. A rescue. The people bring a rescue or two. Yeah. Ah! Ah! No, 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 my lord, be good to me, I beseech you, stand to me. How now, Sir John? What, are you brawling here? Doth this become your place, your time and business? You should have been well on your way to York. Stand from him, fellow, wherefore hangst thou upon him? Oh, my most worshipful lord, and please your grace, I am a poor widow of East Cheap, and he is arrested at my suit. Hmm? What sum? Oh, it, it is more than for some, my lord. It, it is all for all I have. He hath eaten me hmm? out of house and home. He hath put all my substance into that fat belly of his but I will have some of it out again, or I will ride thee a knights like the mare. I think I am as like to ride the mare, if any have any vantage of ground to get up. How comes this, Sir John? What man of good temper would endure this tempest of exclamation? Are you not ashamed to enforce a poor widow to so rough a course to come by her own? What is the gross sum that I owe thee? Mary, if thou wert an 
honest man, thyself and the money too. Thou didst swear to me upon a parcel gilt goblet sitting in my dolphin chamber at the round table by a sea coal fire upon Wednesday in Weeson week when the prince broke thy head for liking his father to a singing man of Windsor. Thou didst swear to me then as I was washing thy wound to marry me and make me my lady thy wife. Canst thou deny it? Did not good wife Keach, the, the, the butcher's wife, come in then and call me gossip quickly? Coming in to borrow a mess of vinegar, telling us she had a good dish of prawns, whereby thou didst desire to eat some, whereby I told thee they were all ill for green wound. And didst thou not, when she was gone downstairs, desire me to be no more so familiarity with such poor people, saying that ere long, they should call me madam. And didst thou not kiss me and bid me fetch thee 30 shillings? I, I put thee now to thy book oath. Deny it if thou canst. My lord, this is a poor mad soul. And she says up and down the town that her eldest son is like you. She hath been in good case, and truth is, poverty poverty hath distracted her. But for these foolish officers, I beseech you, I may have redress against them. Sir John, Sir John, I am well acquainted with your manner of wrenching the true cause the false way. Yeah. It is not a confident brow, nor the throng of words that come with such more than impudent sauciness from you can thrust me from a level consideration. You have, as it appears to me, practiced upon the easy yielding spirit of this woman and made her serve your uses both in purse and in person. Yea, in truth, my lord. Pretty peace. Pay her the debt you owe her and unpay the villainy you have done with her. The one you may do with sterling money and the other with current repentance. M my lord, <clears throat> I, I will not undergo this sneep without reply. You call honorable boldness impudent sauciness. If a man will make curtsy and say nothing, he is virtuous. And no, my lord, my humble duty remembered, I will not be your suitor. I say to you, I do desire deliverance from these officers being upon hasty employment in the king's affairs. You speak as having power to do wrong, but answer the effect of your reputation and satisfy the poor woman. Come hither, hostess. Now, Master Gower, what news? The king, my lord, and Harry, Prince of Wales, are near at hand. The rest the paper tells. As I am a gentleman. Oh, faith, you said so before. As I am a gentleman. Come, no more words of it. By this heavenly ground I tread on, I must be fain to pawn both my plate and the tapestry of my dining chambers. Glasses. Glasses is the only drinking, and for the thy walls a pretty slight drollery, of, or the story of the prodigal, or the German hunting in the waterwork is worth a thousand of these bed hangers and these fly-bitten tapestries. Let it be ten pound if thou canst. Come, and twere not for thy humors, thou there's not a better wench in England. Go, wash thy face, and... Pray thee, Sir John, let it be but 20 nobles. In faith, I am loath to pawn my let fate, it so, so God save the law. Let it alone, I'll make other shift. You be foolish still. Well, you shall have it, though I pawn my gown. I hope you'll come to supper. You'll pay me altogether? Will I live? Go with her, uh, with her hook on, hook on. Well, will you have uh, doll tear sheet meet you at supper? Uh, no more words, let's have her. I've heard better news. 
What's the news, my lord? Where lay the king tonight? At Basingstoke, my lord. I hope my lord all's well. What, what is the news, my lord? Come all his forces back. No, 1,500 foot, 500 horse are marched up to my lord of Lancaster against Northumberland and the archbishop. Uh, come the king back from Wales, my noble lord. You shall have letters of me presently. Come, go along with me, good Master Gower. M my lord. What's the matter? Uh, Master Gower, shall I entreat you with me to dinner? I must wait upon my good lord here. I thank you, good Sir John. Sir John, you loiter here too long, being you are to take soldiers up in counties as you go. Will you sup with me, Master Gower? What foolish master taught you these manners, Sir John? Master Gower, if they become me not, he was a fool that taught them me. This is the right fencing grace, my lord, tap for tap, and so part fair. The lord like Thou art a great fool. Before God, I am exceeding weary. <laughs> Just come to that? Uh, I had thought weariness does not have attached one to so high blood. <laughs> Faith, it does me, though it discolors the complexion of my greatness to acknowledge it. Doth it not show vile in me to, to desire small beer? <laughs> Why, a prince should not be so loosely studied as to remember so weak a composition. Huh? Oh, be like then my appetite is not princely got. For by my troth, I do remember the poor creature, small beer. <laughs> but in these humble considerations make me out of love with my greatness. What a disgrace it is to me to remember thy name, or to know thy face tomorrow, or to take note how many pair of silk stockings thou hast. <laughs> These and those that are thy peach-colored ones, or to bear the inventory of thy shirts as one for superfluity and another for use. But that the tennis court keeper knows better than I, for it is a low ebb of linen with thee that thou keepest not a racket there, as thou hast not done it in a great while, because the rest of the low countries have made a shift to eat up thy Holland, and God knows whether those that ball out in the ruins of thy linen shall inherit his kingdom. But the midwives say the children are not at fault, whereupon the world increase and kindreds are mightily strengthened. How ill it follows after you have labored so hard, you should talk so idly. Tell me, how many good young princes would do so, their fathers being so sick as yours at this time is, hmm? Shall I tell thee one thing, Poins? Yes, faith! And let it be an excellent good thing, huh? It shall serve among wits of no higher breeding than thine. Go to! I stand the push of your one thing that you will tell, hmm? Well, Mary, I'll tell thee, it is not meet that I should be sad, though my father is sick. Albeit I could tell thee, as to one it pleased me for fault of a better to call a friend, I could be sad, and sad indeed, too. Mm hmm? Very heartily upon such a subject. By this hand, thou thinkest me as far in the devil's book as thou in false step for obduracy and persistency. Let the end try the man, but I'll tell thee, my heart bleeds inwardly, for my father is so sick. And keeping such vilely, vile company as thou art, hath in reason taken from me all obstentation of sorrow. The reason? What wouldst thou think of me, if I should weep? I would think thee to be a most princely hypocrite. Mm, it would be every man's thought, and thou art a blessed fellow to think as every man thinks. Uh -huh. Never a man's thought in the world keeps the road better way than thine. Every man would think me a hypocrite indeed, and what excites your most worshipful thought to think so? Why, because you have been so lewd and so much engrafted to Falstaff? And to thee. <laughs> By this light I am well spoke on. I can hear it with mine own ears. The worst that they can say of me is that I am a second 
brother. Hmm? And I am a proper fellow of these hands. Those two things, I confess, I cannot help. Mm, by the mass, here comes Bardolph. Oh, and the boy that I gave Falstaff. I had him for a Christ, from, from me a Christian, and look if the fat villain have not transformed him ape. God save your grace. And yours most noble Bardolph. Um, you virtuous ass, you bashful fool. Must you be blushing? Wherefore blush you now, huh? What a maidenly man at arms are you become? Is such a matter to get a Pottle Pot's maidenhead, hmm? What calls me in now, my lord, through a red lattice? Uh, I could discern no part his face from the window. At last I spied his eyes, and methought he had made two holes in the whale's wife's petticoat, and so <laughs> peeped through. Uh, has not the boy profited? Away, you horse and upright rabbit, away! Away, you rascally Althea's dream, away! <laughs> oh, instruct us, boy. What, what dream, boy? Oh, well, Mary, my lord, Althea dreamed that uh, she was delivered from of a firebrand, and therefore I call her, him a, her dream. Uh, <laughs> a crown's worth for good interpretation. There it is, boy. Oh, that this blossom could be kept from cankers. <laughs> well, there is six pence to preserve thee. Hmm? And you do not make him hanged among you. The gallows shall have wrong. And how doth thy master, Bardo? Well, my lord, he heard from your grace. Uh, he heard of your grace is coming to town. There's a letter for you. Ah, delivered with good respect. And how doth thy mortal mass, your master? In bodily health, sir. Mary, the immortal part needs a physician, but that moves not him. Though that it be sick, he dies not. I do allow this when to be familiar with me as my dog, and he holds his place. But look, look how he writes. John Falstaff, knight. <laughs> Man must know that as doct as he has occasion to name himself. Even like those that are kin to the king, they never uh, prick their finger, but that they say, Oh, there's some of the king's blood spilt. How comes that, says he, that takes upon him not to conceive you? Sir, is as ready as a borrower's cap. I am the king's poor cousin, sir. God. <laughs> Nay, they will be kin to us, or they fetch it up, uh, or they will fetch it from Japheth. But the letter, <laughs> Sir John Falstaff, knight to the son of the knight nearest his father, Harry, Prince of Wales. Greeting. Well, that's a certificate. Oh, peace. I will imitate the honorable Romans in brevity. He sure means brevity in breath, short-winded. I commend me to thee, I commend thee, and I leave thee. <laughs> uh, be not too familiar with poins, for he misuses thy favor so much that he swears thou art to marry his sister Nell. Repent at idle times as thou mayest, and so farewell. Thine by yea and no, which is as much as to say, as thou usest him. Jack Falstaff with my familiars, John with my brothers and sisters, and Sir John with all of Europe. My lord, I will steep this letter in sack and make him eat it. That's to make him eat twenty of his words. But do you use me thus, Ned? Must I marry your sister? Oh, God send the wench no worse a fate, but I never said so. Well, thus we play the fools with time, and the spirits of the wise sit in the clouds and mock us. Is your master here in London? Yea, my lord. Ah, where's Supsy? Doth the old boar feed in the old Frank? At the old place, my lord, in East Cheap. Mm. What company? Ephesians, uh, my lord, of the old church. Uh, uh, what, what pagan may that be? None, my lord, but the old mistress quickly and mistress doll tear sheet. Oh, yeah, and, and who may she be? A proper gentlewoman, sir, and a kinswoman of my master. Hmm. Even such kin as the parish Heckfers are to the town bull. Uh, shall we steal upon them, Ned, at supper? I'm your shadow, my lord, I'll follow you. 
Sirrah, you boy and Bardolf, no word to your master that I am yet come to town. And uh, there is for your silence. I have no tongue, sir. And for mine, uh, sir, I will govern it. Fare you well. Go. <laughs> this doll tear sheet should be some road. I warrant you, as common as the way between St. Albans and London. How might we see Falstaff bestow himself tonight in his true colors and not ourselves be seen? Hmm. Put on two leather jerkins and an apron and wait upon him at his table as drawers. <laughs> From a god to a bull, a heavy dissension. It was Joe's case. From a prince to apprentice, a low transformation that shall be mine. For in everything the purpose must weigh with a folly. Follow me, Ned. Mm. I pray thee, loving wife and gentle daughter, give even way unto my rough affairs. Put not you on the visage of the times, and be like them to Percy troublesome. I have given over, and I will speak no more. Do what you will, your wisdom be your guide. Alas, sweet wife, my honor is at pawn, and but my going, nothing can redeem it. Yet, for God's sake, go not to these wars. The time was, Father, that you broke your word when you were more endeared to it than now. When your own Percy, when my heart, dear Harry, through many a northward look to see his father bring up his powers, but he did long in vain. Who then persuaded you to stay at home? There were two honors lost, yours and your son's. For yours, the God of heaven brightened it. For his, it stuck upon him as the sun in the gray vault of heaven. And by his light did all the chivalry of England move to do brave acts. He was indeed the glass wherein the noble youth did dress themselves. He had no legs that practiced not his gait. And speaking thick, which nature made his blenish, became the accents of the valiant. For those that could speak low and heartily would turn their own perfection to abuse to seem like him. So that in speech, in gait, in diet, in infections of delight, in military rules, humors of blood, he was the mark and glass, copy and book that fashioned others. And him, wondrous him, O oh, miracle of men, him did you leave, second to none, unseconded by you, to look upon the hideous god of war and disadvantage, to abide a field where nothing but the sound of Hotspur's name did seem defensible. So you left him. Never. Oh, never do his ghost the wrong to hold your honor more precise and nice with others than with him. Let them alone. The marshal and the archbishop are strong, and my sweet Harry had but half their numbers today might I, hanging on Hotspur's neck, have talked of Monmouth's grave. Beshrew your heart, fair daughter. You do draw my spirits from me with, with new lamenting ancient oversights. But I must go and meet with danger there, or it will seek me in another place and find me worse provided. Oh, fly to Scotland till that the nobles and the armed commons have them of their puissance made a little taste. If they get ground advantage of the king, then join you with them, like a rib of steel to make strength stronger. What? For all our loves, first let them try themselves. So did your son. He was so suffered. So came I, a widow. And never shall have length of life enough to rain upon remembrance of mine eyes that it may grow and sprout as high as heaven for recordation to my noble husband. Come, come go in with me. Tis with my mind as well with the tide swelled up into this height that makes a standstill running neither way. Fain would I go to meet the archbishop, but many thousand reasons hold me back. I will resolve for Scotland. There am I, 
till time and vantage crave my company. What the devil hast thou brought there, Apple John? Thou knowest, Sir John cannot endure an Apple John. Mm. Mass, thou sayest true. The prince once set a dish of Apple Johns before him and told him they were five more Sir Johns, and putting off his hat said, I will now take my leave of these six dry, round, old, withered knights. <laughs> it angered him to the heart, but he had forgot that. Why then, cover and set them down and see if thou canst find out Sneak's noise. Mistress Tearsheet would fain hear some music. Mm. Dispatch. The room where they supped is too hot. They'll come in straight. Oh. Here, I, here will be the prince and Master Poins and Nun, and they will put on two of our jerkins and aprons, and Sir John must not know of it. Bartle hath brought word. And by the mass, here will be old Eudis. It will be an excellent stratagem. Well, I'll see if I can find out Sneak. Ah, uh, Faith. Sweetheart, me thanks now. You are in excellent good temporality. Your pulsage beats as extraordinarily <sighs> as a heart would desire. And your color, I warrant you, is as red as any rose in good truth law oh but in faith you have drunk too much canaries <laughs> and that's a marvelous searching wine and it perfumes the blood air one can say what's this how do you you now better than i was Ooh. Ooh. i that's well said. <laughs> ah, good hearts worth gold. <laughs> oh, whoa. <laughs> Here comes Sir John. <laughs> when Arthur first in court empty the Jordan and was a worthy king. Oh, how now, Mistress Dahl? <laughs> Sick of a calm, yea, good faith. So is all her sect, and they be once in calm, they are sick. Damn you, you muddy rascal. Is that all the comfort you give me? Oh, you make fat rascals, Mistress Doll. I make them. Gluttony and disease make. I make them not. Oh, if the cook helped to make the gluttony, you help to make the diseases, Doll. We catch of you, Doll. We catch of you. Grant that my virtue. Grant that. Yeah, Joy. Our chains and our jewels. Uh, your brooches, pearls, and ouches. For to serve bravely is to come halting off, you know. To come off the breach and his pike bent bravely into surgery bravely. To venture upon the char ch charge chambers bravely. Hang yourself, you muddy conger. Hang yourself. Ah, uh, oh, by my throat, this uh, is the fashion. <laughs> You two never meet, but you fall to some discord. You are both in good truth as, ah, oh, rheumatic as two dry toasts. Ah, oh, you cannot one bear with another's conformities. What the good year. <laughs> oh, one must bear, and that must be you, you are the weaker vessel, as they say, the emptier vessel. <laughs> Can a weak, empty vessel bear such a huge full hogshead? There's a whole merchant's venture of Bordeaux stuff in him. You have not seen a Hulk better stuffed in the hold. <laughs> oh, come, I'll be friends with thee, Jack. Thou art going to the wars. And whether I shall ever see thee again or no, there is nobody cares. Sir, ancient pistols below and would speak with you. Hang him, swaggering rascal. 
Let him not come hither. It is the foul mouthedest rogue in England. Oh, if he swagger, let him not come here. <laughs> no, by my faith, I must live among my neighbors. All those swaggerers. I am in good name and fame with the very best. <laughs> Shut the door. Here comes no swaggerers here. I have not lived all this while to have swaggering now. <laughs> Shut the door, I pray you. Dost thou hear, hostess? Pray ye, pacify yourself, Sir John. There comes no swaggerers here. Dost thou hear, it is mine ancient. <laughs> tell me, tell me. Sir John, never tell me. And your ancient swagger comes not in my doors. I was before Master Tissick, the WD, the other day. And as he said to me, "'Twas no longer ago than Wednesday last. And could fit neighbor quickly, he says. Master Dunby, our minister, was by then. Neighbor quickly, says he, receive those that are civil for he said you are in an ill mate now i said so i can tell whereupon for he says you are an honest woman <laughs> i will thought on therefore take heed what guest you receive receive he says no swaggering companions of here comes none here. Who would bless you to hear what he said? No, I'll no swaggerers. He's no swaggerer, hostess. A tame cheater of faith. You may stroke him as gently as a puppy greyhound. Ooh. Will not swagger with a barberry hen if your feathers turn back in any show of resistance. Mm. Call him up, drawer. Cheater, call you him. I won't bar no honest man. My house, nor no cheater but i do not love swaggering by my troth i am the worst when one says swagger feel masters how i shake look you i warn you oh you do hostess oh how do i in very truth do i and toward aspen leaf i cannot abide swaggerers God save you, Sir John! Ah! <laughs> Welcome, ancient Pistol. Here, Pistol, I charge you with a cup of sack. Do you discharge upon mine hostess? I will discharge upon her, Sir John, with two bullets. <laughs> <laughs> she is pistol-proof, sir. You shall not hardly offend her. Um, I'll drink no more proofs, nor no bullets. I'll drink no more then will do me good for no man's pleasure i uh, well then to you mistress dorothy i will charge you charge me i scorn you scurvy companion what you poor base rascally cheating lacklin and me Away, you moldy rogue. Away, I am meat for your master. Mm, I know you, Mistress Dorothy. Away, you cut purse rascal. You filthy bung. Away. <laughs> By this wine, I'll thrust my knife in your moldy chaps and you play the saucy cuddle with me. Away, you bottle ale rascal. <laughs> Basket hilt stale juggler, you since when? I pray you, sir, God's light with two points on your shoulder. But God, let me not live, but I will murder your rough for this. No more, Pistol. I would not have you go off here. Discharge yourself of our company, Pistol. Oh, oh good Captain Pistol. No, here, sweet Captain. Oh. Captain, thou abominable damn cheater. Art thou not ashamed to be called Captain? And captains were of my mind. They would truncheon you out for taking their names upon you before you have earned them. <laughs> you, a captain. <laughs> you slave for what? 
<laughs> for tearing a poor horse rust in a body house. <laughs> you captain. <laughs> and you rogue. He lives upon moldy stewed prunes and dried cakes. <laughs> captain. <laughs> <That's light. laughs> Villains will make the word as odious as the word occupy, which was an excellent good word before it was ill sorted. Therefore, captains had need look to it. <laughs> Go down, good ancient. Uh, hark thee hither, Mr. Skull. Not I. I tell thee what, Corporal Bardolph, I could tear her. I'll be revenged of her. Oh, pray thee, go down. I'll see her damned first to Pluto's damned lake by this hand of the infernal deep with Erebus and tortures vile also. Hold hook and line, say I. Down, down, dogs. Down, fighters. Have we not a hiring here? Oh, good <laughs> captain, <laughs> peace will be quiet. It is very late in faith. I beseech you now. Aggravate your collar. Be good humors indeed. Shall pack horses and hollow pampered jades of Asia, which cannot go but 30 mile a day, compare with Caesar and with cannibals and Trojan Greeks? <laughs> Nay, rather damn them with King Cerebus and let the welkin roar. Shall we fall foul for toys? <laughs> By my troth, <laughs> Captain, these are very bitter words. Be gone, good ancient. This will grow to a brawl anon. Die men like dogs. Give <laughs> crowns like pins. Have we not Hiron here? I, my word, Captain, there's none such here. What a good year. Do you think I would deny her? <laughs> Sake, be quiet. Then feed <clears throat> and be fat, my fair Calypolis. Come, give me some sack. Si fortune mi tormente sperato mi contento. <laughs> Very broadsides. No, let the fiend give fire. Give me some sack and sweetheart. <laughs> Lie thou there. Come. The full points here and our etc. is no thing. Pistol, I would be quiet. Sweet knight, I kiss thy knee. Oh. What we have seen the seven stars. Oh, for God's sake, thrust him downstairs. I cannot endure such a fustian rascal. Thrust him downstairs. Know we not Galloway nags? Quite him down, Bardolph, like a shove groat shilling. Uh, nay, and I do nothing but speak nothing. I shall be nothing here. Come get you downstairs. What? Shall we have incision? Shall we embrew? Oh. Then death rock me asleep, abridge my doleful days. And why then let grievous, ghastly, gaping wounds untwine the sisters three? Come, at your post, I say, come! God, here is goodly stuff toward. Give me my rapier, boy. I pray thee, Jack. I pray thee, do not draw. Get you downstairs. Oh, God, here's a goodly tumult. I'll forswear keeping house afore I'll be in these turrets and frights. So, murderer, I warrant now. Alas, alas, what? Up your naked weapons! Put up your naked weapons! Ugh. I pray thee, Jack, be quiet. The rascal's gone. Oh, you horse on little valiant villain, you. Oh, are you not hurt in the grind? Only thought I made a shrewd thrust at your belly. Uh, have you turned him out of doors? Yea, sir, the rascal's drunk. You have heard him, sir, in the shoulder. Oh. A rascal to brave me. Oh, you sweet little rogue, you. Alas, poor Apo, those sweats. Come, let me wipe thy face. Oh, come on, you horse and chops, oh, rogue. If faith, I love thee. 
Oh. How art as valorous as a Hector of Troy, worth five of Agamemnon and ten times better than the nine worthies. Oh, villain. Ah, oh, rascally slave, I will toss the rogue in a blanket. Do and thou darest for thy heart, and thou dost I'll canvas thee between a pair of sheets. <laughs> well, the music has come, sir. Oh, let them play. Uh, play, sirs. Uh, sit on my knee, doll. <laughs> a rascal bragging slave. The rogue fled from me like quicksilver. Have faith, and thou followedst him like a church, thou horse and little tidy Bartholomew boar pig. <laughs> when wilt thou leave fighting a days and foining a nights and begin to patch up thine own body for heaven? Oh, peace, good doll. Do not speak like a death's head. Do not bid me remember mine end. Sarah, what humor's the prince of? Oh, a good, shallow young fellow. It would have made a good pantler, a, would a chipped bread well. They say Poins has a good wit. Oh, he's a good wit. Hang him, baboon. His wit's as thick as Tewksbury mustard. There's no more conceit in him than in, in, in a mallet. Why does the prince love him so then? Because their legs are both of a bigness, and it plays at quite well and eats conger and fennel and drinks off candles ends for flap dragons and rides the wild mare with the boys and jumps upon joined stools and swears with a good grace and wears his boots very smooth like unto the sign of the leg and breeds no bait with telling of discreet stories and such other gamble faculties it has that shows a weak mind and an able body, for the which the prince admits him. For the prince himself is such another. The weight of a hair will turn the scales between their avoidrepoise. Not this knave of a wheel have his ears cut off? Speed him before it's whore. Look where the withered elder hath not his pole clawed like a parrot. Is it not strange that desire should so many years outlive performance? Oh, oh, kiss me, Venus. doll. Saturn and Venus this year in conjunction. What says the almanac to that? And look whether the fiery trigon, his man, be not lisping to his master's old tables, his notebook, his council keeper. Uh, thou dost give me flattering buses. By my troth, I kiss thee with a most constant heart. <laughs> <laughs> I am old. I am old. I love thee better than I love e'er a scurvy young boy of them all. <laughs> well, what stuff wilt have a curdle of? I shall receive money a Thursday, shalt have a cap tomorrow. A merry song, come, it grows late. Will to bed, thou forget me when I am gone. By my troth, thou set me a-weeping, and thou sayest so. Prove that ever I dress myself handsome till thy return. Well, hearken to the end. Uh, some sack, Francis. None, none, and none, none sir. None. Ah, a bastard son of the kings. And art not thou poins his brother? Why, thou globe of sinful continence, what a life dost thou lead? A better than thou, I am a gentleman. Thou art a drawer. Ah, very true, sir, and I come to draw you out by the ears. Oh, Lord, preserve thy grace. By my troth, welcome to London. Oh, oh now the Lord bless that sweet face of thine. <laughs> Jesus, are, are you come from Wales? Thou wholesome mad compound of majesty, by this light flesh and corrupt blood, thou art welcome. <laughs> oh, you fat fool, I scorn you. My lord, he will drag you out of your revenge and turn all to merriment if you take not the heat. Uh, you horse and candle, mind you, how vilely did you speak of me even now before this honest, virtuous, civil gentlewoman? That's blessing of your good heart. <laughs> and so she is, by my troth. Didst thou hear me? Yea, and you knew me, as you did when you ran away by Gadshill. 
You knew I was at your back and spoke it on purpose to try my patience. No, 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 not so. I, I did not think thou wast within hearing. I shall drive you then to confess the willful abuse and then know how to handle you. Uh, no, no abuse, Hal, on oh, my honor, no abuse. <laughs> not to dispraise me. Call me a pantler and bread chipper and I know not what. Uh, no abuse, Hal. Hmm? No abuse? No abuse, Ned. In the world, honest Ned, none. I dispraised him before the wicked, that the wicked turns to the prince might not fall in love with thee, in which doing I have done the part of a careful friend and a true subject, and thy father is to give me thanks for it. No abuse, Hal. None, Ned. None. No, no faith, boys. None. See now whether pure fear and entire cowardice doth not make thee wrong this virtuous gentlewoman to close with us. Is she of the wicked? Is thine hostess here of the wicked? Or is thy boy of the wicked? Or honest Bardolf, whose zeal burns in his nose of the wicked? Answer, answer. thou dead elm, answer. Oh, thy fiend hath pricked down Bardolf erect irrecoverably, and his face is Luf Lucifer's pri privy kitchen, which he doth nothing but roast malt worms. For the boy, there is good angel about him, but the devil blinds him too. For the women? Uh, for one of them, she is in hell already, and burns poor souls. For the other, I owe her money, and whether she be damned for that, I know not. No, I warrant you. No, I think thou art not. I think thou art quit for that. Mary, there is another indictment upon thee for suffering flesh to be eaten in thy house contrary to the law, for the which I think thou wilt howl. All victuals do so. What's a joint of mutton or two in a whole at Lent? You gentlewoman. What says your grace? His grace says that which his flesh rebels against. Oh, oh, who knocks so loudly at door? Look to the door there, Francis. Pito, oh now, what news? The king, your father, is at Westminster, and there are 20 wicked, weary posts come from the north, and as I came along, I met and overtook a dozen captains, bareheaded, sweating, knocking at the taverns, and asking every one for Sir John Falstaff. By heaven, Poins, I feel me much to blame, blame so idly to profane the precious time. When tempest of commotion like the south, born with black vapor, doth begin to melt and drop upon our bare unarmed heads. Give me my sword and cloak. Falstaff. Good night. Now comes in the sweetest morsel of the night, and we must hence and leave it unpicked. More knocking at the door. How now, what's the matter? You must away to court, sir, presently. A dozen captains stay at the door for you. Uh, pay the musician, sir. Uh, farewell, hostess. Farewell, doll. You, you see, my good wenches, how men of merit are sought after. The undeserver may sleep when the man of action is called on. Farewell, good wenches. If I be not sent away post, I will see you again ere I go. I cannot speak if my heart be not ready to burst. Well, sweet Jack, have a care of thyself. Farewell, farewell. Oh, fare thee well. I have known thee these 29 years, come peace got time that an honester and truer hearted man. Well, fare thee well. <laughs> Mistress Tearsheet. What's the matter? Bid Mistress Tearshe come to my master. Oh, run, doll, run. Run, good doll, come. Well, oh, she comes, blubbered. Oh. Yay, will you come, doll? Go, call the earls of Surrey and of Warwick. But ere they come, uh, bid them read o'er these letters. And well consider them. Make good speed. 
how many thousand of my poorest subjects are at this hour asleep. <laughs> sleep. Oh, gentle sleep. Nature's soft nurse, how have I frighted thee that thou no more wilt weigh my eyelids down and steep my senses in forgetfulness? I rather sleep liest thou in smoky cribs upon uneasy pallets stretching thee and hushed with buzzing night flies to thy slumber than in the perfumed chambers of the great under the canopies of costly state and lulled with sound of sweetest melody. O oh, thou dull God, why liest thou with the vile in loathsome beds and leavest the kingly couch, a watch case or a common alarm bell? Wilt thou upon the high and giddy mast seal up the ship boy's eyes and rock his brains in cradle of the root imperious surge and in the visitation of the winds who take the ruffian billows by the top, curling their monstrous heads and hanging them with deafing clamor in the slippery clouds that with the hurly death itself awakes? Canst thou, O partial sleep, give then repose to the wet sea boy in an hour so rude, and in the calmest and most stillest night, with all appliances and means to boot, deny it to a king? Then happy, lo, lie down. Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Many good morrows to your majesty. Is it good morrow, lords? Tis one o'clock and past. Why then good morrow to you all, my lords. Have you read o'er the letters that I sent you? We have, my liege. Then you perceive the body of our kingdom, how foul it is, what rank diseases grow, and with what danger near the heart of it? It is but as a body yet distempered, which to his former strength may be restored with good advice and a little medicine. My Lord Northumberland will soon be cooled. God, that one might read the book of fate and see the revolution of the times make mountains level and the continent weary of solid firmness melt itself into the sea and other times to see the beachy girdle of the ocean too wide for Neptune's hips. How chances mocks and changes fill the cup of alteration with diverse liquors. <laughs> if this were seen, the happiest youth viewing his progress through what perils past, what crosses to ensue, would shut the book and sit him down and die. Tis not 10 years gone since Richard and Northumberland, great friends did feast together. And in two years after, were they at wars? It is but eight years since this Percy was the man nearest my soul, who like a brother toiled in my affairs and laid his love and life under my foot. Yea, for my sake, even to the eyes of Richard gave him defiance. But which of you was by? You, cousin Neville, as I remember, when Richard with his eye brimful of tears, then checked and rated by Northumberland, did speak these words, now proved a prophecy? Northumberland, thou ladder by the which my cousin Bolingbroke ascends my throne, though then, God knows, I had no such intent, but that necessity so bowed the state that I and greatness were compelled to kiss. The time shall come. Thus did he follow it. The, the time will come that foul sin gathering head shall break into corruption. So went on, foretelling the same time's condition and the division of our amity. There is a history in all men's lives, figuring the natures of the times deceased, the which observed a man may prophesy with a near aim of the main chance of things as yet not come to life, 
who in their seeds and weak beginning lie in treasured. Such things become the hatch and brood of time, and by the necessary form of this, King Richard might create a perfect guess that great Northumberland, then false to him, would of that seed grow to a greater falseness, which should not find a ground to root upon, unless on you. Are these things then necessities? Then let us meet them like necessities, and that same word even now cries out on us. They say the bishop in Northumberland are 50,000 strong. Oh, it cannot be, my lord. Rumor doth double, like the voice and echo, the numbers of the feared. Please it your grace to go to bed. Upon my soul, my lord, the powers that you already have sent forth shall bring this prize very easily. To comfort you the more, I have received a certain instance that Glendower is dead. Your majesty hath been this fortnight ill, and these unseasoned hours perforce must add unto your sickness. I will take your counsel. And were these inward wars once out of hand, we would, dear lords, unto the Holy Land. Come on, come on, come on. Give me your hand, sir. Give me your hand, sir. An early stir by the rood. And how doth my cousin silence? Oh, good morrow, good cousin shallow. And how doth my cousin your bedfellow, and your fairest daughter and mine, my goddaughter Ellen? Alas, a black woozle, cousin Shallow. By yea and no, sir, I dare my cousin William has become a good scholar. He is at Oxford still, is he not? Indeed, sir, to my cost. I must then to the inns of court shortly. I was once of Clement's Inn, where I think they still talk of mad Shallow yet. You were called Lusty Shallow then, cousin. By the mass, I was called anything, and I would have done anything indeed, too, and roundly, too. There was I and little John Doit of Half Staffordshire, and Black John Barnes, George Barnes, and Francis Pickbone, and Will Squell, a cutsole man. You had not four such swinge bucklers in all the inns of court again. And I may say to you, we knew where the Bonarobas were and had the best of them all at commandment. <laughs> then was Jack Falstaff, now Sir John, a boy and page to Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk. Uh, this is Sir John cousin that comes hither anon about soldiers? The same Sir John, the very same. I see him break Scoggins head at the court gate when uh, was cracked not thus high. And the very same day did I fight with one Samson Stockfish, a fruiterer, behind Gray's Inn, chased, chased with the mad days that I have spent, and to see how many of my old acquaintance are dead? We shall all follow, cousin. Certain, tis certain, very sure, very sure, death, as the promise saith, is certain to all, all shall die. How a good yoke of bollocks at Steamford Fair. By my troth, I was not there. Death is certain. Is old devil of your town living yet? Dead, sir. Jesus, Jesus, dead. I drew a good bow and dead. A shot, a fine shot. John Agant loved him well and betted him, betted much money on his head. Dead. I would have clapped the clout at twelve score and carried you a forehand shaft at fourteen and fourteen and a half, and how would have done a man's heart good to see? How a score of ewes now? Uh, thereafter, as they be, a score of good ewes may be worth ten pounds. Hmm. And is old double dead? Oh, here come two of Sir John Falstaff's men, as I think. <laughs> good morrow, honest gentlemen. I beseech you, which is uh, Justice Shallow? I am Robert Shallow, sir, a poor esquire of this county and one of the King's Justices of the Peace. What is your good pleasure with me? My captain, sir, commends him to you. My captain, Sir John Falstaff, a tall gentleman by heaven and a most gallant leader. He greets me well, sir. I know him a good backsword man. How doth the good knight? May I ask how my lady his wife doth? 
Uh, <laughs> sir, pardon. A uh, soldier is better accommodated than a wife. It is well said in faith, sir. It is well said indeed, too. Better accommodated. It is good. Yea, indeed it is. Good phrases are surely and ever were very commendable. Accommodated. It comes of commodo. Very good. A good phrase. Pardon, sir. I have heard the word. Phrase, call uh, you it. By this day, I know not the phrase, but I will maintain the word with my sword be given a soldier-like word and, and a word of exceeding good command by heaven. Accommodated, that is, when a man is, as they say, accommodated, or when a man is being whereby uh, may be thought to be accommodated, which is an excellent thing. <laughs> it is very good. Look, here comes good Sir John. Give me your good hand. Give me your worship's good hand. By my troth, you like well and bear your years very well. Welcome, good Sir John. Oh, I'm glad to see you well, my good Master Robert Shello. Uh, Master Shirkard, I think? No, Sir John. It is my cousin Silence in commission with me. Oh, good Master Silence. It befits you. You should be of peace. Your good worship is welcome. Fly, this is hot weather, gentlemen. Uh, have you provided me here half a dozen sufficient men? Mary, have we, sir? <laughs> you know, let me see them, I beseech you. Where's the rule? Where's the rule? Where's the rule? Let me see. <laughs> let me see. So, 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 so. Yay, Mary. Rafe Moldy. Let them appear as I call. Mm -hmm. Let them do so. Let them do so. Let me see. Where is Moldy? <laughs> Here, and <coughs> please you. <coughs> what well, thank, well, thank you, Sir John. A good limbed fellow, young, strong, and have good friends. Is thy name Moldy? Yea, and please you. Tis the more time thou wert uh, used. <laughs> Most excellent of faith. Things that are moldy, black use. Very singular good in faith. Well said, Sir John. Very well said. Prick him. I was pricked well enough before. <coughs> and you could have let me alone. My old dame will be undone now for one to do her husbandry and her drudgery. You need not have pricked me. <coughs> there are other men fitter to go out than I. Go to, peace, Moldy. You shall go, Moldy. It's time you were well spent. Spent? Peace, fellow, peace, stand aside. You know where you are. For the other Sir John, let me see. Simon Shadow. Yea, Mary, let me have him to sit under. He's like to be a cold soldier. <laughs> Where's Shadow? Shadow? Here, sir. Uh, Shadow, whose son art thou? Uh, uh, my mother, sir. Thy mother's son, like enough on thy father's shadow. So the son of the female is the shadow of the male. It is often so indeed, but much of thy father's substance. Do you like him, Sir John? The shadow will serve for summer. Prick him. Aside, for we have a number of shadows fill up the muster book. Thomas Wart. Where's he? Here, sir. Is thy name Wart? Yea, sir. Thou art a very ragged Wart. Shall I prick him, Sir John? It were superfluous, for a peril is built upon his back, and the whole frame stands upon pins. Prick him no more. <laughs> you can do it, sir. You can do it. I commend you well. Francis Feeble. Yes, sir. What trade art thou, Feeble? A woman's tailor, sir. Shall I prick him, sir? You may, but if he had been a man's tailor, he'd have pricked you. <laughs> Wilt thou make as many holes in an enemy's battle as thou hast done in a woman's petticoat? I will do my good, sir, that you can have no more. Well said, good woman's tailor. Well said, courageous feeble. Thou wilt be as valiant as the wrathful dove or more magnanimous mouse. Prick the woman's tailor. Well, Master Shallow, deep Master Shallow. 
I would what might have gone, sir. I would thou wert a man's tailor, that thou mightst mend him and make him fit to go. I cannot put him to a private soldier that is the leader of so many thousand. Let that suffice, more forcible, feeble. Uh, it shall suffice, sir. I am bound to thee, reverend feeble. Who is next? Peter Bolkath of the Green. Yea, let's see Bolkath. Sir, sir. For God, a likely fellow. Come, prick Bolkath till he roar again. <laughs> What? Dost thou roar before thou art pricked? Oh, sir, I am a diseased man. What disease hast thou? <coughs> a horse and cold, sir. <coughs> a, a cough, sir. <coughs> Which I caught, uh, ringing in the king's affairs upon his coronation day, sir. Come. Thou shalt go to the wars in a gown. We will have a way thy cold, and I will take such order that thy friend shall ring for thee. Is all here? Here is two more called than your number. You must have but four here, sir. And so I pray you, go in with me to dinner. Uh, come, I will go drink with you, but I cannot tarry dinner. I, I'm glad to see you by my twelfth master, Shallow. Oh, Sir John. Do you remember since we lay all night in the windmill in St. George's Field? Oh, no more of that, Master Shallow. No more of that. Ha! T'was a merry night. And is Jane Nightwork alive? She lives, Master Shallow. She never could away with me. Never. Never. She would always say she could not abide Master Shallow. By the mass, I could anger her to the heart. She was then a bona roba. Does she hold her own well? Old. Old, Master Shallow. Nay, she must be old. She cannot choose but be old. Certain she's old. And had Robin Nightwork by old Nightwork before I came to Clement's Inn. That's 55 year ago. Ha, ah, Cousin Silence, that thou had seen that this night and I have seen. Ha, ah, Sir John, said I well? Oh, we have heard the chimes at midnight, Master Shallow. That we have, that we have, that we have. In faith, Sir John, we have. Our watchword was, come, boys. Ugh. Let's go to dinner. Come, let's go to dinner. Jesus, the days that we've seen. Come, come. Good Master Corporate Bartle, stand, my friend, and, 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 and here's Four Henry ten shillings in French crowns for you. In very truth, sir, I had as leave to be hanged, sir, as go. And yet, uh, not for mine own part, sir, I, I do not care, but rather because I am unwilling, and for my own part, a desire to stay with my friends. Else, sir, I, I, I do not care, but for mine own part so much. Go to, stand aside. Um, um, good Master Corporal Captain, for my old dame's sake, stand my friend. She has nobody to do anything about her when I am gone, and she is old and cannot help herself. You shall have forty, sir. Go to, stand aside. By my troth, I cared not. A man might can die but once. We owe God a death. I'll ne'er bear a base mind. And be my destiny so, and be it not so. No man's too good to serve a prince, and let it go which way it will. He that dies this year is quit for the next. Well said, thou art a good fellow. Ah, faith, I'll bear no base mind. Come, sir, which of these men shall I have? Or of which you please. Uh, sir, a word with you. Uh, I have uh, three pound of free moldy and bull calf. Go to, well. Come, Sir John, which four will you have? Uh, do you choose for me? Mary, then. Uh, moldy, bull calf, feeble and shallow. Shadow. Moldy and bull calf. 
For you, Moldy, stay at home till you are past service. And for your part, Bullcalf, grow till you come into it. I will none of you. Sir John, Sir John, do not yourself wrong. They are your likeliest men. And I would have you served with the best. Will you tell me, Master Shallow, how to choose a man? Care I for the limb, the thews, the stature, bulk, and big assemblage of a man? Give me the spirit, Master Shallow. Here's Wart. You see what a ragged appearance it is. The change shall, uh, I shall charge you and discharge you with the motion of a pewterer's hammer. Come off and on swifter than he that gibbets on the brewer's bucket. And the same half-faced fellow, Shadow, give me this man. He presents no mark to the enemy. The foeman may be as well as great aim level at the edge of a penknife. And for a treat, how swiftly will this feeble, the woman's tailor, run off? Oh, give me the spare men and spare me the great ones. Put me a cliver into Warp's hands and Bardolf. Uh, hold, Warp Traverse. Thus, thus, thus. Uh, come, manage me your colliver. <coughs> so, uh, very well, go to. Very good, exceeding good. Oh, give me always a little lean old shop bald shot. Well said in faith. Wart, thou art a good scab. Hold, there's a tester for thee. He is not his craft's master. He doth not do it right. I remember at Mile End Green, when I lay at Clement's Inn, I was then Sir Dagonet in Arthur's show, there was a little quiver his piece thus, and would about and about and come you in and come you in, ratata would say, uh, would a say, bounce would a say, and away again would a go, and again would a come. I shall ne'er see such a fellow. Uh, these fellows will do well, Master Shallow. God keep you, Master Silence. I will not use many words with you. Fare you well, gentlemen, both. I thank you. I must a dozen miles tonight. Bardolph, give the soldiers coats. Sir John, the Lord bless you. God prosper your affairs. God send us peace. At your return, visit our house. Let our old acquaintance be re renewed. Peradventure, I will with ye to court. For God. Would you would? Go to. I have spoken a word. God keep you. Farewell, you gentlemen. Farewell. On, Bardolph, leave the men away. As I return, I will fetch off these justices. I do see the bottom of justice shallow. Lord, Lord, how subject we old men are to the vice of lying. The same starved justice hath done nothing but prate on me of the wildness of his youth and the feats he hath done about Turnbull Street. And every third word a lie, doer paid to the heaven, here than the Turk's tribute. I do remember him at Clement's Inn, like a man made of after supper of a cheese pairing. When I was naked, he was for all the world like a forked reddish with a head fantastically carved upon it with a knife. It was so forlorn that his dimensions to any thick sight were invisible. It was the very genius of famine, yet lecherous as a monkey. And whores called him Mandrake. Uh, I, I came ever in the rearward of the fashion and sung those tunes to the overscutched housewives that he had heard the Carmen whistle and swear they were his fancies or his good nights. And now is this vice's dagger become a squire and talks as familiarly of John a gaunt as if he had been the sworn brother to him. And I'll be sworn and never saw him but once in the tilt yard. And then he burst his head for crowding among, amongst the marshal's men. I saw it and told John a gaunt he beat his own name for you might have thrust him in all his apparel into an eel skin. The case of a troubled whole boy was a mansion for him, a court, and now has he land and beefs. Well, I'll be acquainted with him if I return, and shall go hard, but I make him a philosopher's two stones to me. The young dace be the bait for the old pike. I see no reason in the law of nature, but I may snap at him. Let time shape. 
and there an end. What is this forest called? It's Gultry Forest and shall please your grace. Here stand my lords and send discoverers forth to know the numbers of our enemies. We have sent forth already. It is well done. My friends and brethren in these great affairs, I must acquaint you that I have received new dated letters from Northumberland. Their cold intent, tenure and substance thus. Here doth he wish his person with such powers as might hold sortance with his quality, the which he could not levy, whereupon he is retired to ripe his growing fortunes to Scotland and concludes in hearty prayers that your attempts may overlive the hazard and fearful meaning of their opposite. Thus do the hopes we have in him touch ground and dash themselves to pieces. Now what news? West of this forest, scarcely off a mile, in goodly form comes on the enemy, and by the ground they hide, I judge their number upon or near the rate of 30,000. The just proportion that we gave them out, let us sway on and face them in the field. What well-appointed leader fronts us here? I think it is my lord of Westmoreland. Health and fair greeting from our general, the prince, Lord John and Duke of Lancaster. Say on, my lord of Westmoreland, in peace, what doth concern your coming? Then, my lord, unto your grace do I in chief address the substance of my speech. If that rebellion came like itself, in base and abject routs, led on by bloody youth, guarded with rage, and countenanced by boys and beggary, I say, if damned commotion so appeared in his true native and most proper shape, you reverend father, and these noble lords had not been here to dress the ugly form of base and bloody insurrection with your fair honors. You, Lord Archbishop, whose see is by a civil peace maintained, whose beard the silver hand of peace hath touched, whose learning and good letters peace hath tutored, whose white investments figure innocence, the dove, and very blessed spirit of peace. Wherefore do you so ill translate yourself out of the speech of peace that bears such grace into the harsh and boisterous tongue of war, turning your books to graves, your ink to blood, your pens to lances, and your tongue divine to loud trumpet and point of war? Wherefore do I this? <laughs> so the question stands. Briefly, to this end, we are all diseased, and with our surfeiting and wanton hours have brought ourselves into a burning fever, and we must bleed for it, of which disease our late King Richard, being infected, died. But, my most noble Lord of Westmoreland, I take not on me here as a physician, nor do I as an enemy to peace troop in the throngs of military men, but rather show a while like fearful war to diet rank minds sick of happiness and purge the obstructions which begin to stop our very veins of life. Hear me more plainly. I have an equal balance justly weighed what wrongs our arms may do, what wrongs we suffer, and find our griefs heavier than our offenses. We see which way the stream of time doth run and are enforced from our most quiet there by the rough torrent of occasion, and have the summary of all our griefs, when time shall serve, to show in articles, which long ere this we offered to the king, and might by no suit gain our audience. When we are wronged, and would unfold our griefs, we are denied access unto his person, even by those men that have most done us wrong. The danger of the, of the day is but newly gone, whose memory is written on the earth with yet appearing blood, and the examples of every minute's instance present now hath put us in these ill-beseeming arms, not to break peace or any branch of it, but to establish here a peace indeed, concurring both in name and quality. Whenever yet was your appeal denied? Wherein have you been galled by the king? What peer hath been suborned to grate on you, 
that you should seal this lawless, bloody book of forged rebellion with a seal divine. My brother general, the Commonwealth, I make my quarrel in particular. There is no need of any such redress, or if there were, it not belongs to you. Why not to him in part and to us all that feel the bruises of the days before and suffer the condition of these times to lay a heavy and unequal hand upon our honors? <laughs> My good Lord Mowbray, construe the times to their necessities and you shall say, indeed, it is the time and not the king that doth you injuries. Yet for your part, it not appears to me either from the king or in the present time that you should have an inch of any ground to build a grief on. Were you not restored to all the Duke of Norfolk's signatories, your noble and right-remembered fathers? What thing in honor had my father lost that need to be revived and breathed in me? The king that loved him, as state stood then, was force perforce compelled to banish him. And then when Henry Bolingbroke and he being mounted and both roused in their seats, their neighing coursers daring of the spur, they armed staves and charges, their beavers down, their eyes of fire sparkling through sights of steel and their loud trumpet blowing them together. Then, then when there was nothing could have stayed my father from the breast of Bolingbroke. Oh, when the king did throw his warder down, his own life hung upon the staff he threw. Then threw he down himself and all their lives, that by indictment and by dint of sword have since miscarried under Bolingbroke. You speak, Lord, Lord Mowbray, now you know not what. The Earl of Hereford was reputed then in England the most valiant gentleman. Who knows on whom fortune would then have smiled? But if your father had been the victor there, he never had been born out of Coventry. For all the country in a general voice cried hate upon him, and all their prayers and love were set upon Hereford, whom they doted on and blessed and graced and did more than the king. But this is mere digression from my purpose. Here come I from our princely general to know your griefs, to tell you from his grace that he will give you audience, and wherein it shall appear that your demands are just, you shall enjoy them. Everything set off that might so much as think you enemies. But he hath forced us to compel this offer, and it proceeds from policy, not from love. Mowbray, you overween to take it so. <laughs> this offer comes from mercy, not from fear. For lo, within a kin our army lies, upon mine honor all too confident to give admittance to a thought of fear. Our battle is more full of names than yours. Our men more perfect in the use of arms, our armor all as strong, our cause the best. The reason will our hearts should be as good. Say you not then our offer is compelled. Well, by my will, we shall admit no parley. <laughs> that argues but the shame of your offense. A rotten case abides no handling. Hath the Prince John a full commission and very ample virtue of his father to hear and absolutely to determine of what conditions we shall stand upon? That is intended in the general's name. I muse you make so slight a question. Then take, my Lord of Westmoreland, this schedule, for this contains our general grievances, each several article herein redressed, all members of our cause, both here and hence, that are insinued to this action, acquitted by a true substantial form and present execution of our wills. To us and to our purposes confined, we come within our awful banks again and knit our powers to the arm of peace. This will I show the general. Please you lords, in sight of both our battles, we may meet and either end in peace which God so frame, or to the place of difference, call the swords, which must decide it. My Lord, we will do so. There is a thing within my bosom tells me that no conditions of our peace can stand. But you're not that. We can make our peace upon such large terms, and so absolute as our conditions shall consist upon, our peace shall stand as firm as Rocky Mountains. 
Yea, but our valuation shall be such that every slight and false derived cause, yea, every idle, nice, and wanton reason shall to the king taste of this action, that were our royal faith's martyrs in love, we shall be winnowed with so rough a wind that even our corn shall seem as light as chaff, and good from bad find no partition. No, no, my lord, note this. The king is weary of such dainty and such picking grievances, for he hath found to end one doubt by death, revives two greater in the heirs of life. And therefore will he wipe his tables clean and keep no telltale to his memory that may repeat and history his loss to new remembrance. For full well he knows, he cannot so precisely weed this land as his misdoubts present occasion. His foes are so enrooted with his friends that plucking to unfix an enemy, he doth unfasten so and shake a friend, so that this land, like an offensive wife that hath enraged him on to offer strokes as he is striking, holds his infant up and hangs resolved correction in the arm that was upreared to execution. Besides, the king hath wasted all his rods and late offenders, that he now doth lack the very instruments of chastisements, so that his power, like to a fanglass lion, may offer, but not hold. It is very true. And therefore be assured, my good Lord Marshal, if we do now make our atonement well, our peace will, like a broken limb united, grow stronger for the breaking. Be it so. Oh, here is returned my Lord of Westmoreland. The prince is here at hand pleaseth your lordship to meet his grace just distance between our armies. Your grace of York, in God's name then set forward. Before and meet his grace, my lord, we come. You are well encountered here, my cousin Mowbray. Good day to you, gentle lord archbishop, and so to you, lord Hastings, and to all. My lord of York, it better showed with you when that your flock assembled by the bell and circled to hear with reverence your exposition on the holy text than now to see you hear an iron man talking, cheering a rout of rebels with your drum, turning the word to sword and life to death. That man that sits with a monarch's heart and ripens in the sunshine of his favor, would he abuse the countenance of the king? Alack, what mischiefs might he set a brooch in shadow of such greatness? With you, Lord Bishop, it is even so. Who hath not heard it spoken, how deep you were within the books of God? To us, the speaker in his parliament, to us, the imagined voice of God himself, the very opener and intelligencer between the graces, the sanctities of heaven and our dull workings. Oh, who shall believe and you misuse the reverence of your place, employ the countenance of heaven as a false favorite doth his prince's name in deeds dishonorable. You have ta'en up under the counterfeited zeal of God, the subjects of his substitute, my father, and both against the peace of heaven and him have here upsworn them. Good my lord of Lancaster, I am not here against your father's peace, but as I told my lord of Westmoreland, the time misorder doth in common sense crowd us and crush us to this monstrous form to hold our safety up. I sent your grace the parcels and particulars of our grief, which the which hath been with scorn shoved from the court, whereon this hydra son of war is born, whose dangerous eyes may well be charmed to sleep with grant of our most just and right desires and true obedience of this madness cured, stoop tamely to the foot of majesty. If not, we are ready to try our fortunes to the last man. And though we here fall down, we have supplies to second our attempt. If they miscarry, theirs shall second them, and so successive mischief shall be born, and heir from heir shall hold his quarrel up, whilst England shall have generation. You are too shallow, Hastings, much too shallow to sound the bottom of the aftertimes. Pleaseth your grace to answer them directly how far forth you do like their articles. 
I like them all and do allow them well and swear here by the honor of my blood, my father's purposes have been mistook and some about him have too lavishly rested his meaning and authority. My Lord, these griefs shall be with speed redressed upon my soul they shall. If this may please you, discharge our powers unto their several counties as we will ours and here between the armies, let's drink together friendly and embrace that all out their eyes may bear those tokens home of our restored love and amity. I take your princely word for these redresses. I give it to you and will maintain my word and thereupon I drink to your grace. Go, Captain, and deliver to the army this news of paper. Let them have pay in part, and I will please them. Hide thee, Captain. Uh, to you, my noble lord of Westmoreland. I pledge your grace, and if you knew what pains I have bestowed to breed this present peace, you would drink freely. But my love to ye shall show itself more openly hereafter. I do not doubt you. I am glad of it. Health to my lord and gentle cousin Mowbray. You wish me health and very happy season, for I am on the sudden something ill. Against ill chances men are ever merry, but heaviness foreruns the good event. Therefore be merry, cuz, since sudden sorrow serves to say thus, some good thing comes tomorrow. Believe me, I am passing light in spirit. <laughs> so much the worse if your own rule be true. Word of peace is rendered. Hark how they shout. Well, this has been cheerful after victory. A peace is of the nature of a conquest, for then both parties nobly are subdued, and neither party loser. Go to, my lord, and let our army be discharged too. And good, my lord, so please you, let our trains march by us, that we may pursue the men we should have coped with all. Go, good Lord Hastings, and ere they be dismissed, let them march by. I trust, lords, we shall lie together tonight. Now, cousin, wherefore stands our army still? The leaders, having charge from you to stand, will not go off until they hear you speak. They know their duties. My lord, our army is dispersed already. Like youthful steers unyoked, they take their courses east, west, north, south, or like a school broke up, each hurries toward his home and sporting place. Good tidings, my lord Hastings, for the which I do arrest thee, traitor of high treason. And you, lord archbishop, and you, lord Mowbray, of capital treason, I attach you both. Is this proceeding just and honorable? Is your assembly so? Will you thus break your faith? I pawned thee none. I promised you redress of these same grievances whereof you did complain, which by mine honor I will perform with a most Christian care. But for you rebels, look to taste the due meat for rebellion and such act as yours. Most shallowly did you these arms commence, fondly brought here and foolishly sent hence. Strike up your drums, pursue the scattered stray. God and not we have safely fought today. Some guard these traitors to the block of death, treason's true bed and yielder up of breath. Uh, what's your name, sir? Of what condition are you and of what place? I am a knight, sir. My name is Colville of the Dale. Well then, Colville is your name, a knight is your degree, and your place the Dale. Colville shall still be your name, a traitor your degree and the dungeon your place, a place deep enough. So shall you be still Colville of the Dale. Are not you, Sir John Falstaff? As good a man as he, sir, where I am. Do you yield, sir, or shall I sweat for you? If I do sweat, there are the drops of they are the drops of thy lovers, and they weep for thy death. Therefore rouse up fear and trembling and do observance to my mercy. I think you are Sir John Falstaff, and in that thought, yield me. I have a whole school of tongues in thy belly, in this belly of mine, and not a tongue of them all speaks any other word but my name. And I had but a belly of any indifferency. I were simply the most active fellow in Europe. My womb, my womb, 
my womb and does me. Here comes our general. The heat is past. Follow no further now. Call in the powers, good cousin Westmoreland. Now, Falstaff, where have you been all this while? When everything is ended, then you come. These tardy tricks of yours will, on my life, one time or other, break some gallows back. I would be sorry, my lord, but it should be thus. I never knew yet but rebuke and check was the reward of valor. Do you think me a shallow, an arrow, or a bullet? Have I in my poor and old motion the expedition of thought? I have speeded hither with the very extremest inch of possibility. I have foundered nine score and odd posts, and here, travel tainted as I am, have in my pure and immaculate valor taken Sir John Colville of the Daler, Dale, a most furious knight and valorous enemy. But what of that? He saw me and yielded. That I may justly say with the hook nosed fellow of Rome, there, cousin, I came, I saw, I overcame was more of his courtesy than you are deserving. I, I know not. Here he is, and here I yield him. And I beseech your grace, let it be booked with the rest of these day's deeds. And by the Lord, I will have in it in a particular ballad else. Uh, much as the moon dust cinders of the element which shows like pins heads to her uh, believe not the word of the noble therefore let me have the right and let the desert mount thine's too heavy to mount uh, let it shine then thine's too thick to shine well let it do something my good lord that may me do me good and, and call it what you will is thy name colville it is my lord a famous rebel art thou Bill. And, and a famous true subject took him. I am, my lord, but as my betters are that led me hither. Had they been ruled by me, you should have won them dearer than you have. I know not how they sold themselves, but thou, like a kind fellow, gavest them thyself away gratis, and I thank thee for thee. <sighs> now, have you left pursuit? Retreat is made and execution stayed. Send Colville with his confederates to York to present execution. Blunt, lead him hence and see you guard him sure. And now dispatch we toward my court, my lords. I hear the king, my father, is sore sick. Our news shall go before us to his majesty, which cousin you shall bear to comfort him, and we with sober speed will follow you. My lord, I beseech you, give me leave to go through Gloucestershire, and when you come to court, stand my good lord in your stand my good lord in your good report. Fare you well, Falstaff. I, in my condition, shall better speak of you than you deserve. And would you have the wit? Twere better than your dukedom. Good faith. This same young sober blooded boy doth lo not love me, nor a man cannot make him laugh. And that's no marvel. He drinks wine. There's never none of these demure boys come to any proof. For thin drink the salt or cool their blood and making many fish meals that they fall into a kind of male green sickness. And then when they marry, they get wenches. They are generally fools and cowards, which some of us should be too, but for inflammation. A good sherry sack hath a twofold operation in it. It ascends me into the brain, dries me there all the foolish and dull and crudy vapors which environs it, makes it apprehensive, quick, forgetative, uh, full of nimble, fiery, and delectable shapes which deliver do o'er the voice, the tongue, which is the birth becomes excellent wit. The second property of your excellent sherries is the warming of the blood, which before cold and settled, left the liver white and pale, which is the badge, badge of pusillanimity and cowardice, but sherry warms it and makes it coarse from the inwards to the parts extremes. It illumineth the face, which as a beacon gives warning to all the rest of this little kingdom, 
man to arm, and then the vital commoners and inland petty spirits muster me all to their captain, the heart, who great and puffed with this retinue doth any deed courage, and this valor comes of sherry's, so that skill in the weapon is nothing without sack, for that sets it a work. And learning a mere hoard of gold kept by a devil till sack commences it and sets it in act and use. Hereof comes it that Prince Henry Harry is valiant. For the cold blood he did naturally inherit of his father, he hath, like lean, sterile, and bare land, manured, husbanded, and tilled it with excellent endeavor of drinking good and good store of fertile sherries that he has become very hot and valiant. If I had a thousand sons, the first humane principle I would teach them should be to forswear thy potations and to addict themselves to sack. How now, Bardolph? The army is discharged, all and gone. I'll let them go. I'll go through Gloucestershire, and there I will visit Master Robert Shallow Esquire. I have him already tempering between my finger and my thumb. And shortly will I seal him. Uh, come, away. Now, lords, if God doth give successful end to this debate that bleedeth at our doors, we will our youth lead on to higher fields and draw no swords but what are sanctified. Our navy is addressed, our powers collected, our substitutes in absence well invested, and everything lies level to our wish. Only we want a little personal strength. And pause us till these rebels now afoot come underneath the yoke of government. Both of which we doubt not, but your majesty shall soon enjoy. <laughs> Humphrey. My son of Gloucester, where is the prince, your brother? I think he's gone to hunt, my lord, at Windsor. And how accompanied? I, I do not know, my lord. Is not his brother Thomas of Clarence with him? No, my good lord, he is in presence here. What would my lord and father? Nothing but well to thee, Thomas of Clarence. How chance thou art not with the prince, thy brother? He loves thee, and thou dost neglect him, Thomas. Thou hast a better place in his affection than all thy brothers. Cherish it, my boy. And noble offices thou mayest effect of mediation after I am dead, between his greatness and thy other brethren. Therefore, Omit him not, blunt not his love, nor lose the good advantage of his grace by seeming cold or careless of his will. For he is gracious if he be observed. He hath a tear for pity and a hand open as day for meeting charity. Yet notwithstanding being incensed, he is flint, as humorous as winter and as sudden as flaws congeal it in the spring of day. His temper, therefore, must be well observed. Chide him for faults and do it reverently when you perceive his blood inclined to mirth. But being moody, give him time and scope till that his passions, like a whale on ground, confound themselves with working. Learn this, Thomas, and thou shalt prove a shelter to thy friends a hoop of gold to bind thy brothers in, that you, the united vessel of their blood, mingled with venom of suggestion, as force per force the age will pour it in, shall never leak, though it do work as strong as aconitum or rash gunpowder. I shall observe him with all care and love. Why art thou not at Windsor with him, Thomas? He, he is not there today. He dines in London. And how accompanied? 
canst thou tell? With points and his other continual followers. Most subject is the fattest soil to weeds, and he, the noble image of my youth, is overspread with them. Therefore my grief, grief stretches itself beyond the hour of death. The blood weeps from my heart when I do shape and forms imaginary the unguided days and rotten times that you shall look upon when I am sleeping with my ancestors. For when his headstrong riot hath no curb, when rage and hot blood are his counselors, when means and lavish manners, manners meet together, <coughs> With what wings shall his affections fly towards fronting peril and opposed decay? My gracious lord, you look beyond him quite. The prince but studies his companions like a strange tongue, wherein to, to gain the language. Tis needful that the most immodest word be looked upon and learnt, which once attained, your highness knows, comes to no further use, but to be known and hated. So, like gross terms, the prince will, in the perfectness of time, cast off his followers, and their memory shall, as a pattern or a measure, live by which his grace must meet the lives of other, turning past evils to advantages. Tis seldom when the bee doth leave her comb in the dead carrion. Who's here? Westmoreland? Health to my sovereign, and new happiness added to that that I am to deliver. Prince John, your son, doth kiss your grace's hand. Mowbray, the bishop, Scroop, Hastings and all are brought to the correction of your law. There is not now a rebel sword unsheathed, but peace puts forth her olive everywhere. The manner how this action hath been born here at more leisure, may your highness read with every course in its particular. <laughs> Westmoreland, thou art a summer bird, which ever in the haunch of winter sings the lifting up of day. Look, here's more news. From enemies heavens keep your majesty, and when they stand against you, may they fall as those I am come to tell you of. The Earl Northumberland and the Lord Bardolph, with great power of English and of Scots, are by the Shreve of Yorkshire overthrown. The manner and true order of the fight, this packet, please it you, contains at large. <sighs> and wherefore should these good news make me sick? Will fortune never come with both hands full, but write her fair words still in foulest terms? She either gives the stomach and no food, such are the poor in health, or else a feast and take away the stomach, such are the rich that have abundance and enjoy it not. I should rejoice now at this happy news. And now my sight fails. And my brain is giddy. <clears throat> Come near me now, I am much ill. Comfort, your majesty. My royal father. My sovereign lord, cheer up yourself. Look up. Be patient, princes. You do know these fits are with his highness very ordinary. Stand from him, give him air. He'll he'll stand, he'll straight be well. No, no, he cannot long hold out these pangs. The, the incessant care and labor of his mind hath wrought the mirror that should confine it and so thin that life looks through and will break out. People fear me. For they do observe unfathered airs and loathly birds of nature. The seasons changed their manners as the year had found some months asleep and let them over. The river has thrice flowed, no ebb between. And the old folk, times doting chronicles, say it did so a little time before that our great grandsire Edward sicked and died. Speak lower, princes, for the king recovers. This, apop <laughs> this apoplexy will certainly be his end. I pray you take me up and bear me hence into some other chamber. Softly, I pray. 
let there be no noise made, my gentle friends, unless some dull and favorable hand will whisper music to my weary spirit. Call for the music in the other room. Set me the crown upon my pillow here. His eye is hollow and he changes much. Less noise, less noise. So the Duke of Clarence? I'm here, brother, full of heaviness. Well, how now? Rain within doors and none abroad. How doth the king? Exceeding ill. Well, heard he the good news yet? Tell it him. He altered much upon the hearing it. If he be sick with joy, he'll recover with phys without physic. <sighs> Not so much noise, my lords. Sweet prince, speak low. The king your father is disposed to sleep. Let us withdraw into the other room. Will it please your grace to go along with us? No. I will sit and watch here by the king. Why doth the crown lie there upon his pillow, being so troublesome a bedfellow? Oh, polished perturbation. Golden care that keeps the ports of slumber wide open to many a watchful night. Sleep with it now. Yet not so sound and half so deeply sweet as he whose brow with homely big and bound snores out the watch of night. Oh, majesty, when thou dost pinch thy bear, thou dost sit like a rich armor worn in heat of day that scalds with safety. By his gates of breath, there lies a, lies a downy feather which stirs not. Did he suspire that light and weightless down perforce must move? My gracious Lord, my father. This, this sleep is sound indeed. This sleep, that from this golden wriggle hath divorced so many English kings. I do for me is tears and heavy sorrows of the blood which nature, love and filial tenderness shall, O oh dear father, pay thee plenteously. I do from thee is this imperial crown which as immediate from thy place in blood derives itself to me. Oh, where it sits, which God shall guard, put the whole world's strength into one giant arm, it shall not force this lineal honor from me. This from thee. Will I to mine leave as tis left to me? <laughs> Orc, uh, uh, Gloucester, Clarence. Does the king call? What would your majesty? How fares your grace? Why did you leave me here alone, my lord? We left. The prince, my brother here, my liege, who undertook to sit and, and watch by you. The prince of Wales? Where is he? Let me see him. He is not here. This door is open. He has gone this way. Where is the crown? Who took it from my pillow? When we withdrew, my liege, we left it here. The prince has taken it, he, hence, go seek him out. Is he so hasty that he doth suppose my sleep, my death? Find him, my lord of Warwick, tried him hither. Is part of his conjoins with my disease and helps to end me? See, sons, what things you are. How quickly nature falls into revolt when gold becomes her object. 
for this the foolish over careful fathers have broke their sleep with thoughts their brains with care their bones with industry for this they have engrossed and piled up the cankered heaps of strange achieved gold for this they have been thoughtful to invest their sons with arts and martial exercises when like the bee tolling from every flower the virtuous sweets our thighs packed with wax our mouths with honey we bring it to the hive and like the bees are murdered for our pains this bitter taste yields his engrossments to the ending father. Now, where is he that will not stay so long till his friend sickness have determined me? My lord, I found the prince in the next room, washing with kindly tears his gentle cheeks, with such a deep demeanor and great sorrow that tyranny which never quaffed but blood, would by beholding him have washed his knife with gentle eye drops. He is coming hither. But wherefore did he take away the crown? Well, where he comes. Come hither to me, Harry. Depart to the chamber, leave us here alone. I thought to hear you speak again. I wish was father Harry to that thought. I stay too long by thee. I weary thee. Dost thou so hunger for mine empty chair, and thou wilt needs invest thee with my honors before thy hour be ripe? Uh, foolish youth, Thou seek'st the greatness that will overwhelm thee. I stay but a little, for my cloud of dignity is held from falling with so weak a wind that it will quickly drop. My day is dim. Thou hast stolen that which after some few hours were thine without offense, and at my death thou hast sealed up my expectation. Thy life did manifest thou lovest me not, and thou wilt have me die assured of it. Thou hidst a thousand daggers in thy thoughts, whom thou hast whetted on thy stony heart to stab at half an hour of my life. What? Canst thou not, not forbear me half an hour? Then get thee gone and dig my grave thyself and bid the merry bells ring to thine ear that thou art crowned, not that I am dead. Let all the tears that should bedew my hearse be drops of balm to sanctify thy head. Only compound with me thy forgotten dust. Give that which gave thee life unto the worms. Pluck down my officers, break my decrees, from now a time is come to mock at form. Harry the fifth is crowned. Up, vanity, down, royal state. All oh, you sage counselors, hence, and to the English court assemble now from every region, apes of idleness. Now, neighbor confines, purge you of your scum. Have you a ruffian that will swear, drink, dance, revel the night, rob, murder, and commit the oldest sins, the newest kind of ways? 
be happy. He will trouble you no more. England shall double gild his treble guilt. England shall give him office, honor, might for the fifth Harry from curbed license plucks the muzzle of restraint and the wild dog shall flesh this tooth of every innocent. My poor kingdom, sick with civil blows, when that my care could not withhold thy riots. What wilt thou do when riot is thy care? <sighs> thou wilt be a wilderness again, peopled with wolves, thy old inhabitants. Pardon me, my liege, before my tears the moist impediment unto my speech had forestalled this dear and deep rebuke ere you with grief had spoke and had I heard this course of it so far. There's your crown. And he who wears the crown immortally long guarded yours. I affected more than as your honor and as your renown, let me no more from this obedience rise, which my most inward, true, and duteous spirit teacheth most prostrate and exterior bending. God witnessed with me when I came in here and found no course of breath within your majesty, how cold it struck my heart, for I do faint. Oh, let me in my present wildness die and never live to show the incredulous world the noble change that I have purposed. Coming to look on you. You dead and dead almost, my least you think you were. I spake unto this crown as having sense and thus upbraided it. The care upon thee depending had fed upon the body of my father. Therefore thou best of gold art the worst of gold. Oh, they're less fine in care, it is more precious, more preserving life and medicine potable, but thou most fine, most honored, most renowned, hast bearer up. Thus, my most royal liege, accusing it, I put it on my head to try with it as an enemy that had before my face murdered my father. The quarrel of a true inheritance. But infect my blood with joy or swell my thoughts to any strain of pride or if any rebel or vain spirit of mine did with the least affection of a welcome give entertainment to the might of it let god forever keep it from my head and make me as the poorest vassal is that doth which awe and terror kneel to me my son <clears throat> God put it in thy mind to take it hence, that thou mightst win the more thy father's love, pleading so wisely in excuse of it. Come hither, Harry, sit thou by my bed, and hear, I think, the very latest counsel that ever I shall breathe. God knows my son, by what bypaths and indirect crooked ways I met this crown, and I myself know well how troublesome it sate upon my head. To thee it shall descend with better quiet, better opinion, better confirmation, for all the soil of the achievement goes with me into the earth, it seems in me, but as an honor snatched with boisterous hand, and I had many living to upbraid my gain of it by their assistances, which daily grew to quarrel and to bloodshed, wounding supposed peace. All these 
bold fears thou seest with peril, I have answered for all my reign in hath been put as a scene acting that argument and now my death changes the mood for what in me was purchased falls upon me in a more fairer sort so thou the garland wearest successively yet though thou stand'st more sure than i could do thou art not firm enough since griefs are green and all my friends which thou must make thy friends have put their stings and teeth newly taken out by whose fell working I was first advanced and by whose power I well might lodge a fear to be again displaced, which to avoid I cut them off and had a purpose now to lead out many to the holy land, lest rest and lying still might make them look too near unto my state. Therefore, my Harry, be it thy course to busy giddy minds with foreign quarrels, that action, hence borne out, may waste the memory of the former days. <clears throat> More would I, but my lungs are wasted so that strength of speech is utterly denied me. How I came by the crown, God forgive and grant it may with thee in true peace live. Just liege, you won it, wore it, keep it, gave it me. Then plain and right must my possession be, which I, with more than with a common pain against all the world, will rightfully maintain. Look, look, here comes my John of Lancaster. In health, peace, and happiness to my royal father. <laughs> Thou brings me happiness and peace, son John. But health, alack, with youthful wings is flown from this bare withered trunk. Upon thy sight, my worldly business makes a period. Where is my Lord of Warwick? My Lord of Warwick. Doth any name particular belong unto the lodging where I first did swoon? It's called uh, Jerusalem, my noble lord. Lord be to God. Even there my life must end. It hath been prophesied to me many years. I should not die, but in Jerusalem, which vainly I supposed the Holy Land but bear me to that chamber, there I'll lie. In that Jerusalem shall Harry die. By cock and pie, sir, you shall not away tonight. What, Davy, I say? Uh, you must excuse me, Master Robert Shallow. I will not excuse you. You shall not be excused. Excuses shall not be admitted. There is no excuse shall serve. You shall not be excused. Why, Davy? Yes, sir. Davy, 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 Davy. Let me see, Davy. Let me see, Davy. Let me see. Gay Mary, William Cook, bid him come hither. Sir John, you shall not be excused. Uh, Mary, sir. Thus, those prospects cannot be served. Uh, and again, Sir, uh, shall we sow the Hade land with wheat? With red wheat, Davy. Ah. But William Cook, 
Are there no young pigeons? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, here is now the Smith's note for shoeing and plow irons. Let it be cast and paid. Sir John, you shall not be excused. Now, sir, a uh, new link to the bucket must needs be had. And, uh, sir, do you mean to stop any of William's wages about the sack he lost at Hinkley Fair? I shall answer it. Some pigeons, Davy, a couple of short-legged hens, a joint of mutton, any pretty little tiny kickshaws. Tell William Cook. Doth the man of war stay all night, sir? Yea, Davy, I will use him well. A friend of the court is better than a penny in the purse. Use his men well, Davy, for they are errant knaves and will backbite. Ha <laughs> ha, no worse than they are backbitten, sir, for they have Marvale's foul linen. <laughs> well conceded, Davy. About thy business, Davy. I beseech you, sir, uh, to countenance William Visor of Wancote against Clement Hercus of the Hill. There are many complaints, Davy, against that Visor. That Visor is an errant knave, on my knowledge. Uh, I grant your worship that he is a knave, sir, but yet, God forbid, sir, but if a knave should have some countenance at his friend's request, an honest man, sir, is able to speak for himself when his knave is not, huh? I have served your worship truly, sir, for eight years, and I cannot once or twice in a quarter bear out a knave against an honest man. I have little credit with your worship. The knave is an honest friend of mine, sir, therefore I beseech you, let him be countenanced. Go to, I say, he shall have no wrong. Look about, Davy. Yeah. Where are you, Sir John? Come, 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 off with your boots. Give me your hand, Master Bardolph. I am glad to see your worship. I thank thee with my heart, kind Master Bardolph, and welcome, my tall fellow. Come, Sir John. I'll follow you, good Master Robert Cello. Bardolph, look to our horses. If I were sawed into quantities, I should make four dozen of such bearded humors, hermit staves as Master Shallow. It is a wonderful thing to see the semblance coherence of his men's spirits in his. Then by they, by observing him, do bear themselves like foolish justices. He, by conversing with them, is turned into a justice-like serving man. Their spirits are so married in conjunction with the participation of society that they flock together in consent like so many wild geese. If I had a suit to Master Shallow, I would humor his men with the imputation of being near their master. If to his men, I would curry with Master Shallow that no man could better command his servants. It is certain that either wise bearing or ignorant carriage is caught as men take diseases, one of another. Therefore, let men take heed of their company. I will devise matter enough out of this shallow to keep Prince Harry in continual laughter. The wearing out of six fashions, which in four terms or two actions, and a laugh show without intervallums. Oh, it is much that a lie with a slight oath and a jest with a sad brow will do with the fellow that never had the ache in his shoulders. Oh, you shall see him laugh till his face be like a wet cloak all laid up. Sir John. I come, Master Shallow. I come. How now, my Lord Chief Justice, whither away? No doubt the king. Exceeding well. His cares are now all ended. I hope not dead. He's walked the way of nature, and to our purposes, he lives no more. I would his majesty had called me with him. Service that I truly did his life hath left me open to all injuries. Indeed, I think the young king loves you not. I know he doth not, and do arm myself to welcome the condition of the time, which cannot look more hideously upon me than I have drawn it in my fantasy. Here comes the heavy issue of dead Harry. <sighs> that the living Harry had the temper of he, the worst of these three gentlemen. How many nobles then should hold their places that must strike sail to spirits of vile sort? Oh God, I fear I will be overturned. 
Good morrow, cousin Warwick. Good morrow. Good morrow, cousin. We meet like men that had forgot to speak. We do remember that our argument is all too heavy to admit much talk. Well, peace be with him that hath made us heavy. Peace be with us, lest we be heavier. Though no man be assured what grace to find, you stand in coldest expectation. I am the sorrier would twere otherwise. Well, you must now speak Sir John Falstaff fair, which swims against your stream of quality. The princes, what I did, I did in honor, led by the impartial conduct of my soul. And never shall you see that I will beg a ragged and forestalled remission. If truth and upright innocency fail me, I'll to the king my master that is dead and tell him who hath sent me after him. Here comes the prince. Good morrow, and God save your majesty. This new and gorgeous garment, majesty, sits not so easy on me as you think. Brothers, you mix your sadness with some fear. This is the English, not the Turkish court. Amaroth and Amaroth succeeds, but Harry, Harry. Yet be sad, good brothers, for by my faith, it is it very well becomes you. Sorrow so royally in you appears that I will deeply put the fashion on and wear it in my heart. Why then be sad? But entertain no more of it, good brothers, than a joint burden laid upon us all. For me, by heaven, I bid you be assured. I'll be your father and your brother too. Let me but bear your love. I'll bear your cares. Get weep that Harry's dead, and so will I. But Harry lives. That shall convert those tears by numbers into hours of happiness. We hope no otherwise, otherwise for your majesty. You look strangely on me. And you most. You are, I think, assured I love you not. I am assured, if I be measured rightly, your majesty hath no just cause to hate me. No? How might a prince of my great hopes forget so great indignities you laid upon me? What rate, rebuke, and roughly send to prison the immediate heir of England? Was that easy? May this then be washed and lathed and forgotten. Hmm? I then did use the person of your father. The image of his power lay then in me and in the administration of his law, whilst I was busy for the commonwealth, your highness pleased to forget my place. The majesty and power of law and justice, the image of the king whom I represented and struck me in the very seat of judgment, whereon, as an offender to your father, I gave bold way to my authority and did commit you. If the deed were ill, be you contented wearing now the garland to have a son set your decrees at naught, to pluck down justice from your awful bench, to trip the course of law and blunt the sword that guards the peace and safety of your person. Nay more, to spurn at your most royal image and mock your workings in a second body. Question your royal thoughts, make the case yours. Be now the father and propose a son. Hear your own dignity so much profaned. See your most dreadful laws so loosely slighted. Behold yourself so by a son disdained. And then imagine me taking your part and in your power soft silencing your son. After this cold considerance, sentence me, and as you are a king, speak in your state. What I have done that misbecame my place, my person, or my liege's sovereignty. You are right, Justice, and you weigh this well. Therefore, still bear the balance in the sword. And I do wish your honors may increase till you do live to see a son of mine offend you and obey you as I did. So shall I live to speak my father's words. 
Happy am I that have a man so bold that dares do justice on my proper son, and not less happy having such a son that would deliver up his greatness so into the hands of justice. You did commit me, for which I do commit into your hand the unstained sword that you have used to bear with this remembrance, that you use the same with the like, bold, just, and impartial spirit as you have done against me. Well, there's my hand. You shall be as a father to my youth. My voice shall sound as you do prompt mine ear, and I will stoop and humble my intents to your well-practiced wise discretion, directions. And Prince is all. Believe me, I beseech you, my father has gone wild into his grave, for in his tomb lie my affections. And with his spirit, sadly, I survive to mock the expectation of the world, to frustrate prophecies, and to raise out rotten opinion who hath writ me down after my seeming. The tide of blood in me hath proudly flowed in vanity till now. Now it doth turn and ebb back to the sea, where it shall mingle with the state of floods and flow henceforth in formal majesty. Now call we our high court of parliament, and let us choose such limbs of noble counsel that the great body of our state may go in equal rank with the best governed nation, that war or peace or both at once may be as things acquainted and familiar to us, in which you, Father, shall have foremost hand. Our coronation done, we will excite, as I before remembered all our state and God consigning to my good intents. No, no prince nor peer shall have just cause to say, God shorten Harry's happy life one day. Nay, you shall see my orchard, where in an arbor we will eat the last year's pippin of mine own graffing with a dish of caraways and so forth. Come, cousin Silence, and then to bed. For oh God, you have here a goodly dwelling and rich. Baron, 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 beggars all, beggars all, Sir John. Mary, good air. Spread, Davy, spread, Davy. Well this, said. This Davy serves you for good uses. He is your serving man and your husband. A good varlet, a good varlet, a very good varlet, Sir John. By the mass, I have drunk too much sack at supper. A good varlet. Now sit down, now sit down. Come, cousin. Ah, sirrah, quotha, we shall. Do nothing but eat and make good cheer and praise God for the merry year when flesh is cheap and females dear and lusty lads roam here and there so merrily and ever among so merrily. There's a merry heart, good master silence. I give you health for uh, for that anon. Give me. Master brought off some wine, Davy. Ah, sweet sir, sit. I'll be with you anon, most sweet sir, sit. Master Page, good Master Page, sit. Proface, ha <laughs> ha. What you want in meat, we'll have in drink, but you must bear the hearts all, ha <laughs> ha. Be merry, Master Bardolph, and my little soldier there, be merry. Be merry, be merry, my wife has all. For women are shrews, both short and tall. It's merry in hall when beards wags all, and welcome merry shrove tide. Oh, I did not think Master Silence had been a man of this metal. Who I? Oh, I have been married twice, and once there now. <laughs> Here's a dish of leather coats for you. <laughs> Your worship, I'll be with you straight. A cup of wine, sir. A cup of wine that's brisk and fine and drink unto the leman mine and merry heart lives long. Well said, Master Silence. And we shall be merry. Now comes uh, in the sweet of the night. Uh, health and long life to you, Master Silence. Oh, fill that cup 
and let it come. I'll pledge you a mile to the bottom. <laughs> On this part off welcome, if thou wants anything and will not call, be shrew thy heart. Welcome, my little tiny thief. And welcome indeed to, I'll drink to Master Bardolf and to all the Cavaleros about London. Hope to see London once ere I die. And I might see you there, Davy. By the mass, you'll crack a quart together. Ha, will you not, Master Bardolf? Yes, yes, sir, in a pottle pot. By God's ligands, I thank thee. The knave will stick by thee. I can assure thee that a will out. <laughs> assure thee that a will not out. A tis true bread. And I'll stick by him, sir. Why, there spoke a king. Lack nothing, be merry. Look who's at the door there, ho, who knocks? Ah. Why, Simon Snell, have you done me right? Do me right and dub me night. Sam Mingo, is not so? <laughs> tis so. Ah, tis so. Why then say an old man can do somewhat? Uh, and please, your worship, there is one pistol come from the court with the news. Oh, from the court, let him come in. How now, pistol? Sir John, God save you! What, what, wind, what wind blew you hither, pistol? Not the ill wind which blows no man to good. Sweet knight, thou art now one of the greatest men in the realm. My <laughs> lady, I think it be. But Goodman Puff of Barson. Puff, puff in thy teeth, most recreant coward base. Sir John, I am thy pistol and thy friend, and Elder Skelter, I have rode to thee, and tidings do I bring, and lucky joys, and golden times, and happy news of price. I pray thee now deliver them like a man of this world. God, I look the future for the world, and world sings base. I speak of Africa and golden joys. Base Assyrian knight, what is thy news? Let King Copetia know the truth thereof. And Robin Hood, Scarlet and John. Shall donkey curse confront the helicons, and shall good news be baffled? Then Pistol, lay thy head in fury's lap. Honest gentlemen, I know not your breeding. Why then lament, therefore? Give me pardon, sir. If, sir, you come with news from the court, I take it there's but two ways, either to utter them or conceal them. I am, sir, under the king in some authority. Under which king, Bessonian? Speak or die. Under King Harry. Harry the fourth or fifth? Harry the fourth? A footcher for thine office, Sir John. Thy tender lambkin now is king. Harry the fifth, the man. I speak the truth. When pistol lies, do this and fig me like the bragging Spaniard. What is the old king dead? As nail in door, the things I speak are just. Away, Bardolph, saddle my horse. Master Robert Shallow, choose what office thou wilt in the land, tis thine. Pistol. I will double charge thee with dignities. Oh, joyful day. I would not take a knighthood for my fortune. I do bring thee good news. Carry Master Silence to bed, Master Shallow, and my Lord Shallow, be what thou wilt. I am fortune steward. Get on thy boots. We'll ride all night. Oh, sweet pistol. Away, Bardolph. Come, pistol. Under more to me and with all device, something to do thyself good. Boot, boot, Master Shallow. I know the young king is sick for me. Let us take any man's horses. The laws of England are at my commandment. Oh, blessed are they that have been my friends. And woe to my lord, Chief Justice. Let vultures vile seize on his lungs also. Where is the life that late I led, they say? Why, here it is. Welcome these pleasant days. (laughs) 
No, thou errant knave, I would to God that I might die, that I might have thee hanged. Thou hast drawn my shoulder out of joint. The constables have delivered her over to me, and she shall have whipping cheer, I warrant her. There have been a man or two killed about her. Not hook, not hook, you lie. Come on, I'll tell thee what, thou damned tripe visaged rascal. And the child I go with, do me scary, thou wert better, thou hadst struck thy mother, thou paper faced villain. Oh, the Lord, that Sir John were come. I would make this a bloody day to somebody. But I pray God the fruit of her womb miscarry. If it do, you shall have a dozen of cushions again. You have but eleven now. Come, I tired you both, go with me, for the man is dead that you and pistol beat amongst you. I'll tell you what, you thin man in a censor. I'll have you as soundly swinged for this, you blue bottle rogue, you filthy famished correctioner. If you be not Swedish, I'll forswear half curls. Come, come, you knight, she knight errant, come. Oh, God, that right should thus overcome might. Oh, well, if sufferance comes ease. Come, you rogue, come bring me to a justice. I come, you starved bloodhound. Goodman death, goodman bones. Now out of me, though. Come, you thin thing, come, you rascal. Very well. More rushes! More rushes! The trumpets have sounded twice. Will be two o'clock ere they come from the coronation. <laughs> dispatch! Dispatch! Uh, stand here by me, Master Shell. I will make the king do your grace. I will lay upon him as he comes by and do but mark the countenance that he will give me. God bless thy lungs, good knight. Uh, come here, Pistol, stand behind me. Oh, if I had had time to have made new liveries, I would have bestowed the thousand pound I borrowed of you. But tis no matter, this poor show doth better, and that this doth in further zeal I had to see him. It doth so. It shows my earnestness of affection. It doth so. My devotion. It doth, it doth, it doth. And it were to ride day and night, and not to deliberate, not to remember, not to have patience to shift me? It is best, certain. Uh, but to stand stained with travel. Tis semper idem for obsequi hoc nihil est, Tis all in every part. Tis so indeed. My knight, I will inflame thy noble liver and make thee rage. Thy doll and Helen of thy noble thoughts is in base durance and contagious prison, hailed, hailed thither by most mechanical and dirty hand. Rouse up revenge from Ebon Den with fell electo snake for doll is in. Pistol speaks not but truth. I will deliver her. There Trumpet clangor sounds. God save thy grace. King Hal, my royal Hal. The heavens thee guard and keep, most royal imp of fame. God save thee, my sweet boy. My Lord Chief Justice, speak to that vain man. Have you your wits? Know you what tis you speak. My king, my Jove, I speak to thee, my heart. I know thee not, old man. Fall to thy prayers. How ill white hairs become a fool and jester. I have long dreamt of such a kind of man, so surfeit swelled, so old and so profane. But being awaked, I do despise my dream. Make less thy body, hence, and more thy grace. 
leave gormandizing. No, the grave doth gape for thee thrice wider than for other men. Reply not to me with a fool-born jest. Presume not that I am the thing I was, for God doth know, so shall the world perceive that I have turned away from my former self. So will I lose that kept me company. Well, now dost here I am as I have been approach me, and thou shalt be as thou wast, the tutor and feeder of my ride. It's till then, I banish thee oh. on pain of death as I have done the rest of my misleaders, not to come near our person by 10 mile, for competence of life I will allow it. That lack of means and force you do no evils. And as we hear you do reform yourselves, we will, according to your strengths and qualities, give you advancement. Be it your charge, my Lord, to see perform the tenure of my word. Set on. Master Shallow. I owe you a thousand pound. Yea, Mary, Sir John, which I beseech you to let have home with me. <laughs> this can hardly be, Master Shallow. Do not you grieve at this. I, I shall be sent for in private to him. Look you, he must seem thus to the world. Fear not your advancement. I will be the man yet shall make you great. I cannot perceive how, unless you give me your doublet and stuff me out with straw. I beseech <sighs> you, good Sir John, let me have five hundred of my thousand. Sir, I will be as good as my word that, that you heard was but color. A color that I fear you will die in, Sir John. I fear no colors. Go with me to dinner. Come, Lieutenant Pistol, come. Bardolph, I, I shall be sent for soon at night. Go carry Sir John Falstaff to the fleet. Take all his company along with him. My lord. My, my lord. I cannot now speak. I will hear you soon. Take them away. See, si, Fortuna, me tormenta, spero contenta. I like this fair proceeding of the king's. He hath intent his wanted followers shall all be very well provided for, but all are banished till their conversations appear more wise and modest to the world. And so they are. The king hath called his parliament, my lord. He hath. I will lay odds that ere this year expire, we bear our civil swords and native fire as far as France. I heard a bird so sing whose music to my thinking pleased the king. Come, will you hence? First, my fear. Then my courtesy, last my speech. My fear is your displeasure, my courtesy, my duty, and my speech to beg your pardons. <laughs> if you look for a good speech now, you undo me. For what I have to say is of mine own making, and what indeed I should say will, I doubt, prove my own marring, but to the purpose and so to the venture. Be it known to you, as it is very well, I was lately here in the end of a displeasing play to pray your patience for it and to promise you a better. I meant indeed to pay you with this, which if like an ill venture it come <laughs> unluckily home, I break and you, my gentle creditors, lose. Here I promised you I would be and here I commit my body to your mercies. Bait me some, and I will pay you some, and as most debtors do, promise you infinitely. And so I kneel down before you, but indeed to pray for the queen. If my tongue cannot entreat you to acquit me, will you command me to use my legs? And yet that were but light payment to dance out your debt. <laughs> but a good conscience will make any possible satisfaction. And so would I. All the gentlewomen here have forgiven me. If the gentlemen will not, then the gentlemen do not agree with the gentlewomen, which was never seen in such an assembly. One word more, I beseech you. If you be not too much cloyed with fat meat, our humble author will continue the story with Sir John in it, and make you marry with fair Catherine of France, where for anything I know Falstaff shall 
die of a sweat, unless already a be killed with your hard opinions, for Oldcastle died a martyr, and this is not the man. My tongue is weary. My legs are too. I will bid you good night. <laughs> Come on back, everybody. Thank you all for tuning in to this, our reading of Henry IV, part two. And you can tune in next week for the conclusion of the first Henry ad when we will be presenting Henry V. A uh, special shout out to Lucas Gerstner, who completed his three play run as Henry Bolingbroke, Henry IV. Nice job, buddy. All right, come on back next week and join us. <laughs>